Okay, Dr. Romero, are you ready to begin? I am. Great. So, um, all right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cohen. So, um, thank you all, and welcome to the uh, virtual emergency uh, ACIP meeting of April 14th, 2021. Um, thank you all for making time for this uh, meeting. We know that uh, it's uh, a, a lot of time out of your day, and in particular to our um, ACIP voting members, thank you for being here. Um, so, um, let me begin uh, by uh, taking roll. Um, uh, I'm going to ask that uh, the ACIP members uh, state their affiliations and conflict of interest um, as I go through your names. So um, I'll begin with uh, myself. Um, I'm Jose Romero. I'm the Arkansas Secretary of Health and uh, Professor of Pediatrics and Infectious Diseases here at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, and I have no conflict. Uh, Dr. Alt. My name is Kevin Alt, and I'm a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Kansas Medical Center in Kansas City, Kansas, and I have no conflicts. Welcome and thank you. Um, Ms. Bata. Good, good afternoon. This is Lynn Bata. I'm a immunization clinical consultant with the Minnesota Department of Health, and I have no conflicts. Thank you and welcome. Uh, Dr. Bell. Beth Bell, clinical professor in the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington. I have no conflicts. Good morning and welcome. Dr. Bernstein. Good afternoon, all. Um, my name is Hank Bernstein. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the Zucker School of um, Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, and I have no conflicts. Welcome. Dr. Chen. Wilbur Chen, uh, Professor of Medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and I have no conflicts. Thank you and welcome. Dr. Daly. Um, Matt Daly, Senior Investigator at Kaiser Permanente, uh, Colorado, and Associate Professor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Uh, Dr. Fry. Thank you. This is Sharon Fry. I'm a Professor of Internal Medicine at St. Louis University in uh, I'm a prof uh, specialist in infectious diseases. Thank you. Welcome, uh, Dr. Cotton. Camille Cotton. I'm the clinical director of transplant infectious disease and immunocompromised host um, uh, infectious disease at Massachusetts General Hospital, and I'm an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Good afternoon. Welcome, Dr. Lee. Good morning. This is Grace Lee, Associate CMO at Stanford Children's Health, Professor of Pediatrics at Stanford University School of Medicine, and I have no conflicts. Good morning and welcome. Dr. Long. Um, hi, this is Sarah Long. I'm Professor of Pediatrics at Drexel University uh, College of Medicine in Philadelphia and a specialist in pediatric infectious diseases. I have no conflict. Good, uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, Ms. McNally. Hello, Veronica McNally, president of the Franny Strong Foundation based in Michigan, and I have no conflict. Thank you and welcome. Uh, Dr. Paling. Good afternoon. This is Kathy Paling. I am professor of pediatrics in epidemiology and prevention at Wake Forest School of Medicine. I have no conflict. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sanchez. Uh, welcome. This is Pablo Sanchez. I'm a uh, professor of pediatrics at uh, the Ohio State University um, School of Medicine and a nationwide children's hospital, um, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Welcome. Dr. Talbot. Hey, good morning. I want to say good morning. Good afternoon. This is Kit Talbot. I'm an associate professor of medicine and health policy at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And my um, specialty is adult infectious diseases, and I have no complex. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you all for being here. Um, let me go on to the ex officio representatives. Um, as I call your uh, organization, please um, state your name, and um, uh, we'll begin with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Melinda Wharton is going to be covering for Dr. Nancy Messonnier today. Um, Dr. Wharton, are you available yet? Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Melinda Wharton from Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Wharton. 
uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Hi, this is Mary Beth Hans representing the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Welcome. Food and Drug Administration. Good afternoon, Doran Fink for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration Office of Vaccines. Good afternoon, and thank you. Health Resources and Services Administration. Captain Dale Mishler, Division of Injury Compensation Program, standing in for Dr. Mary Regan. Welcome, thank you. Indian Health Service. Captain Thomas Weiser for Indian Health Service. Thank you and welcome. National Institutes of Health. Good afternoon, John Bago, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, NIH. Thank you and welcome. Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. Good afternoon, David Kim, YDP. Welcome, thank you. I will now turn to the liaison representatives. Again, I will call your uh, institution and uh, please uh, state uh, whether you're present. American Academy of Family Physicians. Dr. Pamela Rockwell, AAFP, present. Welcome. American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, Bonnie Maldonado, Professor of Global Health and Infectious Diseases, Chair, Committee on Infectious Diseases for the AAP. Good morning and welcome. Dr. David Kimberlin. David Kimberlin, AAP Red Book, present. American Academy of uh, Physician Assistants. Marie Michelle Leger, representing the American Academy of PAs. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, American College Health Association. Karen McMullen, Cornell University, and Dr. KV Chai, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Thank you both. Welcome. American College of Nurse Midwives. Carol Hayes, present. Thank you. Welcome. American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Dr. Romero, Linda Eckert's oh, sorry, Linda Eckert's on the line, but she said she may or may not be able to respond. Okay, thank you. I'll take that as a present. Um, American College of Physicians. Thank you, sir. Jason Goldman, General Internal Medicine Affiliate Professor at Florida Atlantic University. Pleasure to be here. Good afternoon. Pleasure to have you. Uh, Dr. Schumann, uh, sorry, uh, American Geriatric Society, forgive me. Hench Mater here for AGS. Thank you, sir. Uh, America's Health Insurance Plans. Yeah, this is Bob Gluckman. I'm a general internist, chief medical officer for Providence Health Plans, representing AGM. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. American Immunization Registry Association. Good afternoon. Rebecca Coyles representing ARA today. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, American Medical Association. I'm Dr. Sandra Freihofer, internal medicine physician and adjunct associate professor of medicine at Emory. I'm the liaison for the American Medical Association. Welcome and thank you. American Nurses Association. Brad Riddle, liaison for the ANA present. Thank you. Welcome. American Osteopathic Examina uh, Association. Excuse me. Uh, Stephen Grog, president. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. American Pharmacists Association. This is Steve Foster. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome. Association of Immunization Managers. Hi, Molly Howell, uh, North Dakota Department of Health and representing the Association of Immunization Managers. Welcome and thank you. Association for Prevention, Teaching, and Research. This is Dr. Paul McKinney, School of Public Health and Information Sciences, University of Louisville. Welcome. Thank you. Association of State and Territorial Health Officers, or officials, excuse me, forgive me. Uh, good afternoon. This is Nirav Shah, the director of the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention here on behalf of ASTO. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Good afternoon. Phyllis Arthur, present. Thank you. Welcome. Council of State and Territorial Epidemiology. Hi, it's uh, Dr. Christine Hahn, Infectious Disease Physician and State Epidemiologist for Idaho, representing CSTE. Welcome and thank you. Canadian National Advisory Committee on Immunization. Canadian National Advisory Committee on Immunization. I'll come back to that. Infectious Diseases Society of America. Jeff Duchin, Infectious Diseases Society of America. Good morning. 
Good morning and welcome. International Society for Travel Medicine. <clears throat> Elizabeth Barnett here for the ISTM. Thank you and welcome. National Association of County and City Health Officials. Hi, this is Matt, Matt Zahn representing NHO. I'm present. Thank you and welcome. National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. <clears throat> Greetings. Greetings, this is Patsy Stinchfield, Children's Minnesota, representing NAPNAP. Thank you and welcome. National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. Uh, this is Dr. Bill Schaffner, Professor of Preventive Medicine and Infectious Diseases at Vanderbilt on behalf of the NFID. Welcome and thank you. National Association, uh, sorry, National Medical Association. <clears throat> Good afternoon, this is Pat Whitley-Williams, Pediatric Infectious Disease, representing the NMA. Thank you and welcome. Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society. This is Sean O'Leary, uh, representing Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Good afternoon, Corey Robertson, present. Welcome, thank you. Uh, Society for Adolescent uh, Health and Medicine. Hi, it's Amy Middleman, um, representing SAM. Good Hello, afternoon. thank you and welcome. Uh, Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America. This is Marcy Dries, uh, Christian and Care, representing Shea. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Um, let me go back and see if uh, Canadian National Advisory Committee on Immunization Representative is uh, on. Dr. Romero, okay. I, I believe they may be having a meeting at the same time or around now as well. Thank you very much for letting us know. Um, thank you. Uh, I've, uh, the role is complete. Um, thank you very much. I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Dr. Romero. Did I forget somebody? I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. This is uh, Dr. Fry, a uh, voting member of the ACIP. I, I believe I forgot to mention my conflict of interest. Oh, please uh, do. I have, or my conflicts of interest, I am uh, the St. Louis University uh, principal investigator for the Moderna and Janssen trial here, uh, and I think I should make that public knowledge. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Is, is there, are there any other voting members that feel they need to disclose something that they did not? All right, very good. Um, so thank you all for being here. Let me turn this over. Uh, let me turn this back over to Dr. Cohen to see if she has any opening words before um, I, uh, I Great. call the uh, first uh, speaker. And uh, let me begin by saying that I'm gaveling in the session, which I didn't do uh, because I don't have a gavel. But uh, this uh, meeting is in uh, is in progress. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Right. Romero. I think uh, uh, we're all on board with that. So um, I do have a couple of slides. We're going to do a very shortened introductory session, um, I, but I do want to make a couple of key points about today's meeting, which has um, was really just announced uh, maybe 30 hours ago, um, and so there's a special there are a couple of special considerations. Um, next slide. Um, so please, um, for all of those who, of you who are on the Zoom call, mute your lines um, until you're called on for discussion. When Dr. Romero opens the meeting, please virtually raise your hand. Dr. Romero will first take questions from the voting ACIP members and then ex officio and liaison uh, representatives. Um, please disable your video um, in order for the Zoom call to work uh, most efficiently and uh, except for if there is a vote this afternoon, uh, ACIP voting members will turn on their video during the vote. Um, a couple of additional points about meeting logistics today. Um, we are, um, uh, this, this ACIP meeting was put together in the last uh, 48 hours and there may be some small errors on some of the slides. Um, if we uh, see those errors, we will correct those slides and put them up uh, for final presentation after the meeting. Um, I would ask that from the uh, voting liaison and ex officio members, um, there is a single question at hand today, which is, um, do we have enough information and what should we do with the current information we have available about the safety signal you will hear more about? Um, we know that there are uh, going to be lots of um, really important scientific questions, and uh, but we ask 
um, a couple of things. Uh, please, that your comments or questions stay very focused on the information that was presented um, and or help um, focus on the discussion and the question at hand today. Um, if you have additional uh, scientific or recommendations or suggestions, um, you are always welcome to share those with us. Um, uh, but there is a lot of work that is being done in the space uh, around this issue, and uh, uh, we will present what we know today, and um, we will we anticipate having further discussions. Uh, but we really want to make sure that the discussion um, stays on focus so that we can um, either decide that ACIP comes to a conclusion and has a recommendation to make, or that they need additional time. Next slide. We did open up the docket uh, for oral and written public comment. Uh, this was also a very, it was open for a very short period of time um, because of the last minuteness of this meeting. Um, but we do have a 20 minute um, open uh, public comment session today. Those members, the individuals from the public were randomly selected um, this morning to speak during the time slot. Um, additionally, there is a, an open docket available for written public comment, and that will stay open um, through Friday of this week. Next slide. Um, as you already heard, um, a couple of the uh, ACIP members do have, um, have disclosed uh, uh, potential uh, perceived conflicts of interest related to research that they're doing with, um, uh, with COVID-19 vaccines. Um, we have uh, issued limited uh, conflict of interest waivers for any ACIP member, uh, and those members may ask questions, um, but are asked to uh, withhold from deliberation after the policy question is being deliberated um, and will uh, abstain from uh, votes related to any COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. Um, and that is it uh, today. Um, we will uh, first uh, have uh, Dr. Uh, Beth Bell is going to open us up today, Dr. Romero. We're going to um, have a presentation from the company um, and then take very focused questions. And then we're going to go through a, uh, the rest of the presentations before discussion. Back over to you, Dr. Romero. Thank you very much, Dr. Kong. Um, so uh, let's begin um, with uh, the, the chair of the ACIP working group for COVID vaccines, uh, Dr. Beth Bell, uh, to give an introduction. Uh, Dr. Bell, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and uh, good morning and good afternoon. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, so uh, before I introduce today's agenda, um, there's a couple of um, important uh, issues, contextual issues, that uh, we felt it was important for uh, uh, the committee be aware of in order to kind of best assimilate the uh, information that's going to be presented. So I'm just going to cover a couple of um, areas, reviewing uh, the adenovirus vector vaccines, describing the rare clot events seen after these uh, vaccines, um, and a bit about the ACIP response, and then I'll, I'll go over today's agenda. Next, please. There are two adenovirus uh, vector vaccines, um, the Janssen J&J &J vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine, as I'm sure most of you are aware. The Janssen vaccine is a single-dose vaccine. It uses um, human adenovirus 26 as its vector. An EUA was issued in the United States in February of 2021 of this year. Um, for um, the Janssen vaccine, and ACIP uh, subsequently made recommendation. The EMA, which is the European Medicines Agency, has authorized the Janssen vaccine for Europe, but no doses have been um, delivered or administered in Europe. Now, the AstraZeneca vaccine is a two-dose vaccine. Um, the vector is the chimp adenovirus. Um, it is a... We are awaiting an EU application in the U.S., but it is approved in the U.K. and Europe, and as most of you are aware, uh, has been in wide use in those areas and other parts of the world. Now, there have been concerns raised um, about rare clotting events 
vaccine after COVID-19 adenovirus vector vaccine. The clinical syndromes after both vaccines appear similar. Uh, you will hear more about this during the upcoming presentation. But the extent to which um, the case is seen after each of these uh, adenovector virus vaccines um, represent exactly the same syndrome is not entirely clear at this time and is something else that um, I'm sure will be discussed. Next, please. Now, um, there has been some activity with respect to the AstraZeneca vaccine, which I just wanted to review. Last week, the European um, Medicines Agency, the EMA Safety Committee, released a report that concluded that there was a strong association and probable causal link between the AstraZeneca vaccine and rare clotting events. Um, there were press releases um, from both the European Union and the United Kingdom, and I've summarized them here. From the European Union, there have been 62 cases of CVST, which is central venous sinus thrombosis, um, and 24 cases of splanchnic vein thrombosis, all with thrombocytopenia. Um, 18 of these cases were fatal. Most occurred in females younger than 60 years. They occurred primarily within two weeks of receipt of the AstraZeneca vaccine. And in the EU, unfortunately, because of different ways that the vaccine is used in each country, um, the EU was not able to um, exclude age and gender as risk factors. They just don't have the denominators, I imagine. From the United Kingdom, they reported 79 cases of thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. 19 were fatal. Um, among these, there were 34 cases of CVST with 14 fatalities and 35 cases of other clotting disorders with five fatalities. 51 cases were female and 28 were male. There were, this is um, on the context of a denominator of 20.2 million doses given in the UK. Um, the press release estimated a risk of about four per million persons um, with the comment that there was a slightly higher incidence in younger age groups. Next, please. Um, there very recently um, were um, two reports in the New England Journal of low platelets, that is thrombocytopenia and blood clot thrombosis, after the AstraZeneca vaccine in Europe. These two cases came from, I believe this is a typographical error, from Germany and Austria and Norway. Um, many of these cases had uh, platelet-activating antibodies directed against platelet factor 4, PF4, um, which is a clue to uh, the possible, me possible mechanism here. And the authors of proposed uh, syndrome entitled vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia. Next, please. I just wanted to take a moment to review uh, central venous sinus thrombosis, CVST, um, since this is um, one of the more predominant uh, syndromes uh, or conditions that have been identified. Um, this involves thrombosis uh, within large vessels that are draining blood from the, from the, uh, from the brain. And um, you can see in this um, figure here, which may or not may or may not be readable, um, the various um, parts of the uh, circulation. It mostly occurs among people 20 to 50 years of age, mostly female. Um, risks include pregnancy and, and other identified risks for coagulation, such as oral contraceptives. Symptoms typically include headache, nausea, vomiting, and other neurologic symptoms, and the presentation can be acute. Um, or more chronic, and I'll make the, just make a point that this is kind of an overall description of CVST, and not specifically CVST with thrombocytopenia, which is what um, has been seen um, in the current situation. Next, please. Um, so what uh, has happened as a result of these findings um, in Europe? Um, the EMA's Pharmacovigilance uh, Risk Assessment 
committee doesn't make vaccine policy for the EU. Each country makes its own policy. But many, many countries have um, made new policy and have adopted age-based recommendations. In the UK, on April 7th, the recommendation was made to use the AstraZeneca vaccine in adults 30 years of age and older. In Australia, adults 50 years of age and older. And in other European countries, um, it, it range of from 55 to 70 years of age, depending on the country. Next, please. Now, um, I just want to um, say a little bit about um, the Janssen J&J COVID-19 vaccine, which, of course, is the focus of our meeting today. As I mentioned, um, it received an EUA from FDA in February, and ACIP made recommendations. On April 13th, CDC and FDA issued a joint statement on the J&J COVID-19 vaccine, made the following points that as of um, the day previous, the day before, that more than 6.8 million doses of the vaccine had been administered in the United States. The CDC and FDA were reviewing data involving six cases of CVST in combination with low platelets reported among recipients of the J&J vaccine in the United States. And the statement said that CDC will convene a meeting of the ACIP on Wednesday to further review these cases and assess their potential significance, which is what we're doing today. And that until the process is complete, that they recommend, there's a recommendation to pause the use of the vaccine out of an abundance of caution. Next, please. One of the other things, uh, one of the other things that came out of this press release, the point that was made in the press release, that one of the important reasons was for the pause, was to allow time to provide information to clinicians and to the public about uh, specifics around, uh, and unique aspects of diagnosis uh, and treatment and clinical signs and symptoms to monitor. And the first step in that process occurred with the issuance of a HAN, a Health Alert Network release on April 13th, which uh, provided recommendations for clinicians on diagnosis and treatment, recommendations for public health on how to uh, report cases through VAERS, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, and recommendations for the public on clinical signs and symptoms to monitor and when to seek medical attention. You'll be hearing uh, much more about the details and specifics of HAN um, later on during one of the other presentations today. Next, please. Um, here's a few of those details um, for clinicians for diagnosis and treatment to evaluate patients with a screening um, PF4 ELISA. Um, that would be in, uh, performed for autoimmune heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, con uh, consulting a hematologist, and importantly, don't treat with heparin unless this test is negative, encouraging reporting through VAERS, um, and for the public um, to know uh, to contact a healthcare provider or seek medical care if you develop a severe headache, abdominal pain, leg pain, or shortness of breath, within three weeks of vaccination with the J&J COVID-19 vaccine. Next, please. Um, so the ACIP response um, this week so far has included a meeting on Monday of the Vaccine Safety Technical Advisory Group, asked, and you will hear a report of uh, the outcome of that meeting and a summary um, shortly. Yesterday, there was a meeting of the ACIP COVID-19 Vaccines Workgroup. Again, you'll be hearing about this. And obviously, today, we're having an emergency ACIP meeting um, with a purpose of considering the implications of reported cases of thrombosis and thrombocytopenia after um, the uh, Janssen J&J vaccine. Next, please. So the agenda today um, will include an overview of the safety of uh, Johnson, Janssen's COVID-19 vaccine um, by Dr. Aaron Mari from Janssen Pharmaceuticals of Johnson & Johnson, a uh, presentation on cerebral venous sinus thrombosis with thrombocytopenia after COVID-19 vaccines from VAERS by 
Dr. Tom Shimabukuru, the assessment of the Vaccine Safety um, Committee um, from Dr. Grace Lee, who is the VAST chair, the work group interpretation um, from Dr. Sarah Oliver, um, who's the CDC lead on the work group, public comment, discussion, and then potentially a vote um, with updated interim recommendations, if appropriate at that time. Next. I'm uh, putting here, again, um, our list of the work group members, uh, ex officio members, liaisons, and consultants. Next, please. And uh, all of the CDC uh, participants, and as always, uh, I'm uh, very grateful to everyone for their participation and contributions um, in this process. Uh, next, please. Thank you very much, and I turn the floor back to Dr. Lamedo. Thank you, Dr. Bell, for that introduction. Um, so um, we'll move forward then um, with uh, the presentation by Dr. Anne Marie from Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies, um, an overview of uh, safety with uh, Janssen's COVID-19 vaccine, ad 26 cov 2 s Dr. Marie. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Aaron Marie. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Janssen and Head of our Global Medical Safety Organization. And it's a great pleasure for me and my colleagues to be with you this afternoon uh, to present to the committee. Next slide, please. So in the next 15 slides, uh, which I'm going to step through reasonably quickly in order to respect the committee's time and ensure you have time for questions and answers. I'd like to take you through the relevant Janssen clinical and post-authorization data on the subject of thrombosis, particularly CVST uh, with thrombocytopenia, and also describe our background epidemiological data set in the context of our overall evaluation. Next slide, please. Firstly, I'd like to emphasize that the safety and the well-being of the people who use our products is the number one priority for our company. While causality has not been fully established between these very rare events and our vaccine, we recognize these events could represent an important potential risk with the Janssen vaccine. We're in the process of updating our company core data sheet and working with health authorities to update our labeling appropriately. Johnson & Johnson will continue to monitor this potential risk and we are committed to efforts to ensure vaccinee and healthcare professional awareness of the important signs and symptoms of this event, as well as appropriate diagnosis and management. Next slide, please. I'd now like to take the committee members through a review of the data. I'll start with the clinical trial data. And as the committee is aware, we have two pivotal phase three clinical trials in our program. A study 3001 is the single dose phase three trial. And I'll present here on the slide the adverse event data with respect to venous thrombosis events. And the subsequent slide will be our study 3009, which is still ongoing as well. This study remains blinded, but I will also present to you the venous thrombosis event. So study 3001, we have vaccinated 43,783 participants. And I list along the left column here, row by row, the DVTs, PEs, cerebral venous sinus thromboses, venous thrombosis, and embolism venous terms. There are four columns. The first two columns are the adenoviral vaccine, the placebo, and the number of cases up to 28 days after vaccination. And the third and fourth columns are the total number of cases to date. So as the committee will see, in the 28 days after vaccination, we have collected four DBTs in the active arm of 3001 and two cases in placebo. We have two cases of PE, one case of placebo, we collected one CVST and one venous thrombosis of a limb, 
both of those in the active arm. Total number of cases include 11 BVTs in the active arm, three in placebo, eight pulmonary emboli in the active arm, four in placebo, one CVST already mentioned in the active arm, one in placebo after 28 days, and then the venous thrombosis of the limb and the venous and a, a one venous embolus. Next slide, please. In study 3009, which is the ongoing phase three two-dose pivotal trial, we have vaccinated 28,277 participants. This study remains blinded and the data are presented as blinded. In this study, we have had one pulmonary embolus event up to 28 days. We have had two DVTs at all time points and four PEs also beyond 28 days. Again, this study remains blinded. Next slide, please. There is also a, an ongoing study, a large open label study in South African healthcare professionals. This has enrolled currently 2,000, uh, 272,438 participants of a total anticipated 500,000 participants. And I'm presenting the safety data to you here as of the 9th of April. As of that date, we have had no reports of CVST. We have had one case of pulmonary embolus. There has been no information on platelet or COVID status with this case. We have had one case of CVA in a 38-year-old female, eight days after vaccination, and are actively seeking additional information on this case through the PI. And we have had a case, one report of retinal vein thrombosis in a 68-year-old diabetic, and the platelet count for this case was reported as normal. Next slide, please. I'd now like to take the committee through all known cases of CVST and all known cases of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia with the Janssen COVID vaccine to date. This is the slide derived from the CDC public website showing the number of vaccinations to date administered in the United States with the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. And as of this morning, I believe that number is now 7.2 million doses administered. And as of 14th of April, Janssen is aware of six post-authorization cases of cerebral venous sinus thrombus, four of six with low platelets, and two unknown uh, within these individuals vaccinated. Next slide, please. This is the table uh, as described of all known cases of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia with the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. The first two rows are the cases already described within the phase three clinical trial program. The following rows are the post authorization cases. In study 3001, the first row, the case was of a 25-year-old male on vaccine. The report was of a CVST with hemorrhage. It was noted that the subject had stenosis of his transverse sinus. And there was a suspected upper respiratory tract infection. The platelet count Nadir was reported at 64,000. We have recently retrospectively determined that his antiplatelet factor IV antibodies at baseline were negative. And post-vaccination, I believe around day 28, but may be corrected, uh, were positive. His COVID status was negative. Time to onset was eight days after vaccination. And this Gentleman was treated with heparin, TPA, received platelets, had two balloon angioplasties, 
and thrombectomies due to uh, the, the, the discovery of a um, venous sinus stenosis. And he has recovered and has been discharged from hospital. The second row from study 3001 is the participant who has recovered from a CVST. She was a 24-year-old female but was on placebo. She had a normal antiplatelet factor 4 antibody test post-vaccination, post-incident. Her COVID status is negative. The time to onset was greater than 50 days after vaccination. I'd next like to describe seven post-authorization cases, including one of deep venous thrombosis. The committee may be aware that cases in the post-authorization phase come to Janssen primarily from two sources. The first three cases described and the final case come through the VAERS Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, the joint CDC-FDA uh, reporting system. We gain access to these reports when they're refreshed every Friday. There is a slight lag in reporting to us. And understandably, for privacy reasons, there uh, is significant redaction of some of the data fields, and it is not possible for us to follow up for further information or evaluation beyond what is pre presented to us in the preliminary report. We can attempt to do so through freedom of information applications, and FDA has been very supportive in helping us to try to expedite these requests. The other cases come to us directly, either through our call center or through our website or email. And these clearly allow us the opportunity to go back and get further information and are therefore a richer data set. So after I have described the post authorization cases to the committee, I will quickly step through three cases that contain significant, uh, significant details of interest to this discussion. The first case in the post authorization phase, the first row in blue after the green row was a 45 year old female. She presented CVST with hemorrhage. No risk factors were described in the report. The report notes the term thrombocytopenia. COVID status was unknown. Time to onset after vaccination was reported at 11 days. Treatment was not described. And this patient died. The second case also came through VAERS. It was a 38-year-old female. She presented with CVST, risk factors unknown, platelet count unknown, COVID status was not described in the report, time to onset was 10 to 14 days after vaccination. She was treated with heparin, and at this time, she is described in the report as not recovered. The third case was a 59-year-old female she presented with extensive deep venous thrombosis on her left side. She had known coronary artery disease. Her platelet count in the deer was reported at 15,000. COVID status unknown. Time to onset after vaccination was seven days. A vena cava filter was inserted into, in her inferior vena cava, and she also underwent thrombectomy. The day after the procedure to place the inferior vena cava, she was reported to have significant thromboses on her right side, um, in uh, significant DVTs on her right side, and it was questioned as to whether or not this was secondary to the intervention or, or partially precipitated by the intervention through her right side to place the inferior vena cava filter. At this time in the report, her status is not recovered. The next case is reported as a Janssen serious adverse event report, came to us from Nevada. It, it was an 18-year-old female. She presented as a CBST with hemorrhage, risk factors unknown, platelet count in the deer was 16,000, the COVID status was unknown, time to onset after vaccination was 14 days. She was initially treated on heparin, and then switched to what is reported as treatment according to the British guidelines, which I take to refer to the guidance uh, um, announced by the expert hematology panel 
uh, affiliated with the British Society of Hematology, and she then also underwent a thrombectomy. At this time, her status is described as not recovered. The next case was reported directly again to Janssen. This was reported through pre-publication by the New England Journal via an editor notification directly to the company, and the case is in Nebraska. This is a 48-year-old female. She was reported as presenting with TTP, splanchnic vein thrombosis, CVST. She was initially given heparin, and then additional hepatic and splanchnic vein thrombosis was reported. Risk factors unknown. Her platelet count in the deer was reported at 13,000. She was also reported to have a high D-dimer and a positive antiplatelet factor for antibody test. COVID status was reported as negative. Time to onset 14 days after vaccination. She was treated with heparin at first, and then after the antiplatelet factor 4 antibody test resulted, she was switched to our gabatran and then also given IV IG. At this time, her status in the report is not recovered. The next case was also reported to Janssen directly, comes from New Jersey in Pennsylvania. The case is a 26-year-old female who was presented with CVST, PE, portal vein thrombosis. Risk factors described are obesity, platelet count was 120,000. She also had a high D-dimer and a positive antiplatelet factor for assay. Her COVID status was negative. Time to onset after vaccination was seven days. She was treated with heparin and then with IVIG and has been discharged from hospital. The final case came, was, was notified to us through VAERS, has very limited detail on the company side it refers to a 28-year-old female, and details are pending under a Freedom of Information application via um, FDA to CDC. I'd now like to take you through three of these cases which have more detail. The first case I'd like to go to is the New England Journal case, the pre-publication case that I mentioned from the University of Nebraska, which we received on Thursday, the 8th of April. This 48-year-old woman was described as having an unremarkable past medical history, presented to ER after three days of malaise and abdominal pain. The initial evaluation describes mild anemia and severe thrombocytopenia with a platelet count of 13,000. A blood smear confirmed marked reduction in platelet count with occasional schistocytes. She had hypofibrinogenemia, a prolonged APTT, and markedly elevated D-dimer, and was noted to have extensive splanchnic vein thrombosis on CT. She was transferred then to the reporting institution with further evaluation and progression noted of the thrombosis on heparin. She had a negative PCR test for SARS-CoV-2, a head CT for new onset, on onset headaches um, reported in her secondary hospital, showed cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. Thrombosis progressed with hemorrhagic stroke despite treatment with heparin. She underwent repeat CT angiography, which showed new thrombus involving the right hepatic and, splen and splenic veins. Further inquiry revealed the patient received a vaccine 14 days before symptom onset. The report describes evidence and then management of possible immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia, ITT. She had positive antiplatelet factor four slash heparin antibodies by ELISA. Her latex enhanced ELISA assay, immune assay was negative. Her heparin was switched in the second hospital to our gabatran. She was given IVIG one gram per kilogram of body weight for two days. Her platelet count was reported to have increased from 30,000 to 145,000 over five days. And she remains critically ill as of the last report. The next case also reported directly to Janssen 
and subsequently further details received on a phone call contact with the physician on Monday, the 12th of April, is of a 26-year-old woman who is described as overweight but active. I believe she's a, a gym instructor with no history of clotting disorder and on no medication. She initially presented to the emergency room with severe headache approximately one week following vaccination. She has been discharged home from the ER. She was then discharged home from the ER with paracetamol and Benadryl. However, her headache persisted. She was subsequently admitted to hospital another week later with abdominal pain and a rapid heart rate. COVID-19 infection was ruled out, although we have no details of the exact test. Laboratory evaluation revealed thrombocytopenia with a platelet count in the deer at 120,000, elevated D-dimer, and normal fibrinogen described, but the level exact, exact level not known. The diagnostic scan showed CVST, portal vein thrombosis, and pulmonary embolus. She was initially treated with heparin, and this was described as having been switched to IVIG after the clinical team became aware of a positive anti-PF4 antibody test result. Her platelet count reportedly started to increase before the IVIG was commenced. This patient has been discharged home on oral anticoagulants after a period of one to one and a half weeks in hospital. Next slide, please. This case is from our clinical trial program, study 3001, and is of a 25-year-old male, healthy, active male, who was vaccinated on September 21, 2020. Eight days after vaccination, the subject became, began to feel progressively unwell, describes fatigue, faintness, nausea, headache, for which he took NSAIDs. 11 days post-vaccination, that's three days later, he describes continued fatigue, weakness and nausea, and also abdominal pain and headache. A COVID-19 swab taken by the PI on that date was negative. He was then hospitalized 19 days post-vaccination after a visual disturbance and collapsing. This was on, the, the, on October 9th, 2020. Laboratory evaluation the platelet count was reported at 64,000, PT 17.7, INR 1.46, fibrinogen 154, white blood count 12.4, hemoglobin 12.7, hematocrit 36.1. He underwent CT, MRI, and venogram, and his diagnosis was of a cerebral venous sinus thrombus and secondary cerebral hemorrhage. Gentleman underwent repeated cerebral vascular sinus thrombectomy and balloon venoplasty due to reocclusion and treatment for a tight stenosis in his venous sinus. He was also treated with low molecular weight heparin and IV TPA. Extensive hematology and infectious disease laboratory evaluations showed inconclusive results. Uh, please excuse the typo, that should read inconclusive results. The patient was discharged on treatment with apixaban. Last week, stored serum tested positive for anti-PF4 antibodies for the post-vaccination phase and the baseline laboratory anti-PF4 antibody test was negative. This gentleman recovered after repeat thrombectomy and balloon angioplasty. He was described as having severe epiglottitis while in hospital, uh, and his discharge meds included apixaban. I would next like to briefly invite my colleague, Dr. Courtney Davis, to describe the epidemiological analysis that we have conducted to assist this investigation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marie. I'm happy to join you today. I'm Courtney Davis. I'm an epidemiologist from our Global Epidemiology Group at Janssen. And we conducted a published literature search. Actually, the, the articles that were retrieved um, included studies and populations from the US and EU, 
as well as from the Middle East and Asia Pacific. We also conducted an internal analysis of large healthcare databases. And what you'll see on the next slide are results from a meta-analysis across four large U.S. healthcare claims databases and one U.S. electronic health record database. And that study design um, was to generate background incidence rates of CVST. We used the study period of 2017 to 2019 um, to, to generate the incidence of the outcome CVST. The methods used for that analysis are similar to those that were used in the multinational network cohort study of 15 different adverse events of special interest and those, uh, the results of that larger network study have been shared with FDA and EMA and are uh, published on a preprint server and a manuscript of, of those AESI background rates are also under review. Could go to the next slide. So these are kind of hard to read. I apologize, it's a lot of numbers, but I uh, did want to be transparent in showing estimates from the published literature. Those are um, in the bottom rows of the table um, and also those from database analyses conducted by Janssen and also um, uh, by the access group in Europe. So I will start with the bottom actually because that's the published literature and that may be um, what folks are more familiar with. And those um, are, are shown for overall adults, uh, the background incidence rate, these are shown um, per 100,000 person years. And those range from uh, 0 0.2 to 0.5 or 2 to 5 per million. Um, in the older studies uh, to um, higher rates, um, up, upwards of about 15 per million in um, the more recent studies that come from um, the, the bottom two references there. The results of our claims database are the first row, and those are not published yet. As I, as I mentioned, those were, were just generated. And those are by age and sex, and we thought it was important to, to display that for you since there is more attention uh, as a potential higher risk among younger women. And what you can see displayed there are, in fact, higher rates um, observed from this claims database analysis, um, the highest uh, being observed in the women ages 18 to 34, which shows 2.6 per 100,000 or 26 per million, um, and an overall rate for ages 18 to 85 uh, in women of 17 per million or in men of 12 per million. That gives you a, an understanding of, of the range of, of the estimates from more contemporary claims database. But I would like to point out limitations um, of the claims data include there is no validation of the outcome of CVST. And that is, um, we did the best we could with the diagnoses which come from hospitalized events. And finally, I would just mention that right now we're working on stratified analysis of CVST incidents by thrombocytopenia, and that um, is underway right now. I'll hand it back over to you, Dr. Marie. Thank you, Courtney. Next slide, please. And Dr. Davis's presentation reminded me to uh, inform the committee that while uh, we don't have ethnicity reported in all of the post-authorization reports, we do know that the single case of CVST in the active arm in our 3001 study was in a white male, the 25-year-old. And we do have the data on two of the post-market reports indicating that they were two white females, but the others uh, are not, it's, it's not described in those case reports. Thank you for the reminder, Courtney. And finally, uh, the Janssen is conducting an intensive ongoing review of internal and publicly available data, including but not lim limited to evolving literature on the relationship between COVID and thrombocytopenic and thrombotic events. 
We're interrogating case reports of association between thromboembolic events, including CVST with ITP and TTP, and also searching the U.S. vaccine adverse event reporting system data on thrombocytopenic and thrombotic events and other adverse events of special interest for all available vaccines, and also the European Eudrovigilance adverse event uh, data set. So in conclusion, uh, Chairperson, I'd like to reiterate that based on the current data, Janssen believes the overall benefit risk profile for our vaccine is positive across the population for which it's authorized. We strongly support ensuring vaccine, a vaccine awareness of the signs and symptoms of this very rare event, as well as the recommendations to ensure the correct diagnosis, treatment, and reporting by healthcare professionals. Thank you. Dr. Murray, thank you very much for that uh, detailed and uh, uh, comprehensive review of what is known. Um, we're going to open it up to questions uh, now from uh, the voting members initially and then liaisons. Um, and um, at the risk of uh, revealing my uh, knowledge lacunae, um, can you tell me what, if any, is the significance of the um, uh, latex uh, enhanced negative assay on the first case that you presented or for pf1 or for uh, P antiplatelet factor antibodies <clears throat> so dr romero if there are hematologists uh, present they will be more expert than i however it has been represented to me that for the pf4 test it's important to use the elisa test but some of the other assays may not be uh, as sensitive as the uh, the ELISA test for anti-PF4. So in the case where both were reported to us, we represented both. Very good. Thank you for that clarification. Let me see if I can turn to my list of questions. Um, are there any questions? You can raise your hand, please. Uh, Dr. Bernstein. Thank you for that uh, presentation. Um, obviously, this is a, a unique circumstances. I just had a couple of questions just for clarification. Um, one, uh, one of the patients, a number of the patients were described as having recovered. And one of the patients was described as discharged from the hospital. Uh, is that considered recovered or what is recovered means they're back to normal or they're still being treated and monitored? Thank you for your question, Dr. Bernstein. The reports, for, which are known as SIOMS reports that are reported to theirs, have a number of fields, including a field for status uh, with a, a limited number of options available. So. Some of what is represented is, is, is somewhat clunky uh, form terminology um, with the, due to the limited options available. Thank you. And then on slide 15, with the background incident rates of CVST, um, were those cases, we do not know about their platelet counts. So those. This, these are the background incident rate, incidence rates of CVSD without thrombocytopenia, correct? Uh, this Let is me Dr. Ask Davis. Dr. Davis. Thank you. This is all CVSD, and it is not stratified in this analysis by thrombocytopenia data. So, that's what we're working on at the moment, um, is to split those and to be able to generate an incidence rate for CBST with concurrent thrombocytopedia or low platelet counts versus uh, the cases that do not. Um, right now, this is just any CBST. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez, please. Thank you, Jose. I have a uh, I thank you for the presentation, certainly um, uh, concerning. Um, I had a few questions. First of all, 
did any of the women where they um, had a recent pregnancy or were any postpartum? Um, second of all, did any have a history of like preeclampsia in a previous in, a, in some pregnancy? And then, if you have any information on other medications such as oral contraceptives that some of these women may have been receiving. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. We did scan all reports and send questions back to those for whom we had identifiable reporters asking those. Uh, and as per the presentation, we don't have reports of recent pregnancy or recent or, or, or the subject being in the postpartum period or having suffered preeclampsia. I don't believe any of the participants other than the one woman, the 24-year-old female in the placebo arm in our clinical study who had a CVST at beyond 50 days. She was on OCP, but it is not described in the best, to the best of my recollection for any of the cases post-vaccination. Dr. Romero, I just want to also add to the committee, uh, let the committee know that the next presentation by Dr. Shima Bakura will go through the VAERS reports uh, with some specificity um, and, and will share any information we have about those cases. Thank you for that information, Dr. Cohn. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Sanchez or, or Dr. Marie, do you have any more to add? No. Very good. Very good. Sorry, I did, wanted to make sure I didn't cut anybody off. Uh, Dr. Paling, please. <clears throat> Hi, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I wanted, um, when I was listening to the presentation, I believe the one case from New Jersey, Pennsylvania that was directly um, reported had CVST with um, pulmonary embolism. I wanted to ask, were there any cases of pulmonary embolism without CVST that you guys are aware of? And are you um, looking for those? Thank you, Dr. Paling, for the question. We have had cases of pulmonary embolus, but none reported in the context beyond what's been described today, none reported with concomitant thrombocytopenia. Thank you. Uh, how, many Dr. Paling, cases, you. Um, how many cases have been reported and the time frame? Let me just pull up the table for you here. Dr. Nettles, could you pull up table 18 and Dr. Chang remind me if there are other tables? So this is a, while well, Dr. Nettles is pulling up the table, we have interrogated the VAERS database looking for thrombocytopenic, thromboembolic, and hemorrhagic events um, that have been observed after vaccination. And we have a report as of the 9th of April. We've had 55 reports of thromboembolism. We've had four reports, the third row down of thromboembolism with thrombocytopenia. We've had two cases of CVST and then other adverse events specifically described in the rows below. And that's at an exposure of 4.9 million doses administered. Dr. Paling, any other questions? Dr. Marie, please forgive me. I, since I cannot see you, I'm not sure if you're done with your answers. Thank you, yes, indeed. In addition, in the phase three program, which is on slide 19, uh, the summary of total venous thrombosis events, uh, up to 28 days in the first column there, you'll see two PEs in the active arm and two balanced with two in placebo. So that again, just reiterating in a more comprehensive slide, um, the venous thrombosis events from our 43,000 person study. Dr. 
Dr. Pelling, anything else to add or questions? I do not. Anybody? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Alt, please go forward. I want to just ask a quick follow-up question. Uh, you had mentioned the Ebola vaccine and the RSV vaccine that used the same vector, and there were no uh, cases uh, uh, of this in that uh, with the, in those trials. Were there any thrombotic events or thrombocytopenic events, especially an imbalance? Uh, you in the Ebola vaccine trial, I believe you had a fair number of pregnant and postpartum women, so you definitely had people that had risk factors enrolled in those trials. Thank you, Dr. Holt, for the question. I'd like to ask my colleague, Dr. Duwogi, from our clinical team to respond to that. We certainly have had no CVST events, as you mentioned, but I'll, I'll let Dr. Duwogi respond to your question more broadly. So, I hope you can hear me well. Makaya Duwogi, Head of Clinical Development and Medical Affairs for Vaccines. So, um, it's true we have not seen uh, uh, CVSTs in any of our um, programs, uh, Ebola and RSV are probably the bigger, the biggest ones. Um, we we have had some cases of CVT and, and PE. Um, none, to to our knowledge, are associated with thrombocytopenia, and there were clear risk factors, so OCPUs, um, that, that that were considered um, attributable to the to the events. Thank you. And, and just, uh, you know, if, if I, if there's just one case of um, immune thrombocytopenia that we had in the RSV program. Uh, we don't, we don't know if there is anti-PF4 antibody. I mean, we're, this is relatively new and this is a case from maybe a, a year or so ago. We will go back and look to see if there are any stored samples to be able to test. Um, we don't have that information, but that's, that's the only case that we have. And the denominator is uh, for, for what I'm talking about is about 200,000 people or more that have received at least one dose of an adeno-based vaccine. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dr. Long, please. Yes, uh, it's a question probably for uh, Dr. Davis about, uh, I, I didn't quite understand how the epidemiologic studies were done related to the uh, healthcare uh, uh, people that you had under surveillance. I know you, they had to be in the system for a year, and then did you follow them for a year? And are these basically numbers of cases expected in 100,000 pieces people over one year? Because my question would be then, did you do any other sort of tricky analysis because the clustering of these cases around the vaccine obviously is um, very uh, provocative and kind of compelling. So did you estimate the number of cases, if you took some random event like uh, the anniversary of the person's birthday and asked in one month after some random event, what then would be the number of cases per 100,000 people in one month's time? Thank you for that question, Dr. Long. Uh, I'll try to describe uh, the cohort design, and then I'll try to answer your specific question. So yes, it's a, it's a kind of classic incidence uh, cohort design where the, the person had to be observed in the database uh, for a year prior to prove that uh, they didn't have um, a CVST in their history. Um, so it, it is um, looking for new diagnoses of CVST in a, in a one-year follow-up period. So I hope that that answers the first part. Uh, the second part, though, your question around picking a random date and then looking out one month. I mean, we did look up to a year, um, and. Uh, we, you know, I, I think if you wanted to, to generate a person month estimate, um, I, I don't have a specific way to answer your question, I, I don't think. Um, uh, maybe the CDC people will address this a little bit, but I'm tempted to want to divide by 12 for the background incidents in a month's time. Mm -hmm. Uh, unless there's some other reason for these other 
uh, sporadic cases to be clustered, and um, which would change very much what the dynamic was of was this in the expected range if they occurred within a month or even two months of vaccination. Thank you. Yeah, when we, uh, maybe I could also add, when we convert this to an expected number, when we do the formal observed to expected analysis, that's ex that is what happens. So we do convert it into, if we are generating it for a 28 day risk period, which we would be doing, that then we do divide by 12 in order to create the uh, expected number. And that would also be using the age and sex specific rates. I see. So in the, in the women of 18 to 34 year age group where it might be 26 per million, it might actually be two per million expected. Right. In a month, in a month's time, 28 day time. We, we, we convert it based on, and you know, we apply it to the actual exposure uh, distribution for the vaccinated when we go through that exercise. But to answer your question, I think simplistically, yes. If we want to use these rates to convert them to a expected 28 month, I mean, 28 day um, observed, I mean, expected, yes. But, you would divide by 12. And Dr. Definitely. Long, I do think that some of this will be um, brought out in future Thank you. Uh, discussions. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McNally, please. Thank you. Dr. Murray, I'm the consumer representative, and I am just trying to understand the reporting process on safety events. So can you help me understand how Janssen makes the FDA and CDC aware of serious adverse events that are reported directly to Janssen, and then what extent Janssen shares the details of those cases with FDA and CDC. Thank you very much for the question. The, uh, when patients uh, are, or when subjects are vaccinated in our clinical trial, there is a, a, an expedited serious adverse event reporting process by our clinical trial process through to the health authorities, um, Mrs. McNally. When the, in the post-authorization phase, when the vaccine is being given to the public, there are a number of ways in which patient experiences or adverse events can be reported. And when patients uh, receive the vaccine, they're, they're often given a fact sheet uh, and there is information presented to them on reporting to the FDA CDC via VAERS. There is a vSAFE uh, program for which I myself signed up, which then uh, sends daily or regular text messages asking for the experience in the post um, authorization first few weeks, uh, which then is sent also to VAERS. And if any reports of adverse events come directly to the company, we have an expedited reporting process whereby we process those cases and send them immediately to the FDA to the European Health Authority and to other global health authorities. So there is a, a continuing, sustained, rapid reporting of events between the companies and the health authorities in the various jurisdictions. The health authorities then do, for cases of particular interest to them, uh, reach out to the company and also uh, with requests for further information uh, and we support those again to the deadlines required by the health authorities. Thank you very much for uh, answering those questions and your team for answering the questions. Um, we're going to move on to the next presentation now um, by uh, Dr. Shimovakuro from the CDC regarding uh, the update on thrombotic, uh, thrombotic, thromboembolic events. Uh, COVID-19 vaccine safety surveillance. Dr. Shimabukuro. Hi, this is Tom. Can you hear me okay? We can. All right. Um, so as Dr. Romero said, uh, today I'm gonna talk about reports of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis with thrombocytopenia after the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. Next slide. So I'll, I'll go over some um, background, basic background, and um, then I'll get into specifics on 
the reports of uh, CVST with thrombocytopenia um, following the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine, and then I'll uh, summarize um, the results of our analysis and uh, our, our plans moving forward. Next slide. Next slide. So uh, you've heard some terms, um, and I've thrown some terms out there that I think um, probably deserve some explanation. Um, and, and these are, uh, <clears throat> for those of us in, in the medical world, probably familiar with these, others maybe not so much. So platelets, um, which are also called thrombocytes, are colorless blood cells that help blood clot. And a normal platelet count is 150,000 to 450,000 per microliter. In the medical world, that's usually shorthanded. We just say 150 to 450. Um, platelets are important in, um, in, in uh, clotting. They stop bleeding by clumping and forming plugs and blood vessel injuries. Thrombocytopenia, which is a condition in which you have low platelet count, um, indicating that you have below 150,000 platelets per microliter of blood. Uh, dangerous internal bleeding can occur when your platelet counts, count falls below 10,000 platelets per microliter. I'm usually say below 10. Um, and though rare, severe thrombocytopenia can cause bleeding into the brain, which can be fatal. Next slide. So I think Dr. Bell went over um, a lot of the detail on the background and kind of set the stage for much of my presentation. And I do repeat a little bit of, of um, what Dr. Bell had her had in her opening presentation. Um, but I, I want to mention that um, th this issue um, has been in the, the public view, um, primarily um, because of the uh, the, um, the the cases of, of rare and unusual blood clots with low platelets following the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. And um, many of these were uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. And I'll get into some of the specifics about what's happening in the United States. Next slide. And I want to start off with the uh, Janssen COVID-19 vaccine timeline. I just want to say that this is for illustrative purposes. Um, it's not drawn to scale. It's just to kind of outline the, the, the timeline of key events um, and, and our, and our uh, investigation and some of the, the timeline for the key decisions that have been made. So on February 27, uh, Janssen received its emergency use authorization. Um, the following day on the 28th, ACIP issued an interim recommendation, and then vaccination started on March 2nd. Um, on March 19th is when we received the first CVST report with thrombocytopenia um, that was reported to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. Um, these are serious reports. Um, individuals wind up in the hospital. They're, they meet the regulatory uh, definition for serious, and so that initiates a record collection and an investigation by CDC and FDA. And um, from the period March 19th um, through the last um, the last confirmed report was on March 8th. Um, we we um, we collected these report. We received these reports. Um, we we conducted a, an expedited record request. Um, we had. Uh, physicians in, at CDC and uh, at FDA and in our CISA program um, do detailed reviews of these cases and accompanying medical records. Um, this investigation uh, is still ongoing, but on, February, or on April 13th, CDC and FDA recommended a pause in the Janssen vaccine. A Han was issued and our investigation continues. Next slide. So this is a screenshot of the uh, CDC Han that went out yesterday, and in the in the uh, the circled area there, you see the some of the key points that CDC will convene an emergency ACIP meeting today um, to further review these cases and assess the potential implications. FDA is continuing their uh, their investigation until the process is complete. CDC and FDA are recommending a pause in the use 
of the J&J COVID-19 vaccine out of an abundance of caution. The purpose of this health alert is in part to ensure that the healthcare community is aware of the potential of these adverse events and can provide proper management due to the unique treatment required with this type of blood clot. Next slide. So um, this is a, a nice 3D um, figure of, uh, of the brain. Um, the brain is one of the most, if not the most vascular organ um, in the body and as such it requires um, substantial venous drainage and you can see here in these these um in these these purple um vein structures th these are th this is the system that that drains um drains the blood from the the brain and um and these are fairly large um veins um it's one thing to note that there th there's quite a bit of redundancy here um so if there is a an issue in one area um other parts of the venous drainage can can compensate so when these uh cerebral venous uh, sinus thromboses do become symptomatic um these are significant blood clots um th that are causing these problems next slide So I want to uh, talk a little about epidemiology and risk factors for CVST. And this information is for CVST in general, um, not necessarily CVST with thrombocytopenia. That's an extremely rare phenomenon. And, um, and, and, and the epidemiology and the background rates are less well understood um, just because it's such a rare condition. So what I'm, what I'm giving you here is, is for CVST in general not necessarily with thrombocytopenia. But um, it just CVST in general is a rare condition um, occurring in about um, 0.22 to 1.57 per 100,000 in the population. It's implica implicated in about um, 0.5 to 1% of all strokes. Um, it's primarily a disease of younger individuals. The median age is 37. It's pretty rare in older individuals, 8% of patients are greater than 65. The female to male ratio is three to one. Um, risk factors include uh, genetic or acquired prothrombotic conditions, um, oral contraceptive use, pregnancy in the postpartum period, malignancy, infection, and then mechanical precipitants, for example, lumbar puncture. Next slide. So the most common presentations are isolated intracranial hypertension syndrome, so headache with or without vomiting, papilledema, visual problems, also focal syndrome, like focal deficit seizures or both, and encephalopathy. Um, more rare presentations include cavernous sinus syndrome, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and cranial nerve palsies. Next slide. So now I'm gonna get in, into the data source and case reports. So um, the data for the, the case reports that I'm going to present come from the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. I know most of you are familiar with VAERS, but I want to mention VAERS is the nation's early warning system for vaccine safety. It is a spontaneous reporting system or passive reporting system. It depends on astute healthcare providers to recognize and report potential adverse events promptly to VAERS, and it is designed um, to detect rare um, and serious adverse events that might indicate a safety problem. It's subject to the limitations of passive surve surveillance in general. Um, but as you'll see, um, VAERS performed exactly as intended in this case. It is intended because it has, um, it has such a wide scope. Um, pretty much anyone in the population who's eligible to get a vaccine is, is, a, is a potential um, subject. Um, it's quite robust, and VAERS rapidly detected these rare, unusual um, thrombotic events in the presence of thrombocytopenia. And I think that this is really a good example of, again, how robust the U.S. vaccine safety monitoring system is, and how in this case, during a, a large-scale national mass vaccination program, the system worked and VAERS functioned exactly as, as planned. And I think this is an example of a success story for vaccine safety. Next slide. 
So I just want to give a kind of a high level overview of what we're seeing for all vaccines. So these are reports of CVST to VAERS after COVID-19 vaccines as of April 12th. And for the Janssen vaccine, we have six reports of CVST with thrombocytopenia. So that's a platelet count of less than 150 following 6.86 million doses administered. That comes out to a reporting rate of 0.87 cases per million doses administered. So just under one case per million doses administered. By contrast, for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, we have zero reports after 97.9 million doses administered. And after the Moderna vaccine, we have three reports following 84.7 million doses administered. But all three of these reports after Moderna had normal platelet counts. And you see the onsets there, two, six, and 12 days after vaccination. Um, so for, for the purpose of of this specific condition, um, we don't consider those three reports cases because again, they had normal platelet counts. Um, so for those of us in vaccine safety, we consider this a reporting rate imbalance um, between the uh, Janssen vaccine and the mRNA vaccines. Next slide. And I'm gonna focus um, on these uh, six reports and describing these in more detail in the next slides. Next slide. Uh, so before I get into the, the, the specific specifics of these reports, I just want to let you know how they come to our attention. So anyone can report to VAERS, healthcare providers, patients, parents, caregivers, um, manufacturers are required to report to VAERS. Um, these these um, reports come in, and if they're, if they're classified as serious, um, according to the regulatory definition for serious, that's death, hospitalization, um, permanent disability, life-threatening illness, prolongation of hospitalization, congenital anomaly or defect. Um, that is, information is captured in the VAERS form. And for the Janssen vaccines, um, folks at CDC and at FDA are, are doing a, 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 what is essentially a pre-screening of these serious reports. So actually, um, pulling them out and looking at them before they go through the normal processing. And when we began to recognize um, some of these unusual um, reports of CVST um, with thrombocytopenia, and we were looking for them because of the uh, information that was coming out of Europe, um, we were able to um, rapidly identify um, potential cases and do an expedited follow-up to get medical records and follow up with the healthcare facilities. And that was often done by people in the immunization safety office directly reaching out and again, um, uh, doing an expedited um, collection of records. So through April 12th, um, again, we have six cases. The median age is 33 years, age range 18 to 48. Median time to symptom onset is eight days range six to 13 days. I wanna say this, this median time to onset is, is different than, than is in the Han. As we continue to gather information, we continue to refine our analysis. In the Han, it was nine days median onset with a range six to 13. It's now eight days, range six to 13. All cases occurred in white females. Um, and you see uh, below um, an indication of, of, of risk factors. Um, there was one case um, that was uh, taking uh, estrogen and progesterone. Um, there were none actually who are pregnant or postpartum, um, three with obesity, um, one with hypothyroidism, hypertension, um, one with asthma. Um, there were no known, there were none um, that had any known coagulation disorders. And I just want to note again, um, thrombosis usually does not occur in the presence of low platelets. Uh, these case presentations are atypical and they're consistent with cases observed after AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. If you um, remember back to the initial slide when we went over some of the basics of, uh, of platelets and thrombocytopenia, um, platelets help actually help you clot blood. You need platelets or they, they, they facilitate the clotting of blood. Um, and what we have here is a picture where we have clots forming in large vessels 
in the presence of low platelets. So it's, it's kind of a paradox here. It, it's unusual. This usually doesn't happen. And like I said, these um, case presentations were um, consistent with cases that were observed after the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. So here are some of the initial and late signs and symptoms of these uh, CVST case patients. Um, they're, they're listed one to six, but they're in no particular order. And I think the, the important thing to note here is these, the initial features are largely um, kind of nonspecific symptoms, which, um, you know, at an initial presentation or when a patient starts to become symptomatic, symptomatic may seem kind of mild and not that, not that clinically significant. Things like headaches, lethargy, chills, myalgia. Um, uh, later features include severe headache, uh, some focal signs, um, in one case, severe abdominal pain, um, bruising, um, swelling in the lower extremities. Um, but if you look again at five of these six cases, really headache is the, is the initial presenting feature. And um, I, so I do think it's important in the, in, the, in the setting we are right now that healthcare providers maintain a high index of suspicion for possible um, CVST and um, confirm um, vaccination history, among other things. Next slide. So this slide is in a bit of a different orientation. You have the patients here in columns, but the, the, and, and there's some uh, more detail about the locations of the CVST, um, intracerebral hemorrhage, and other thromboses. The, the important thing I want to point out here is what I've circled in red at the bottom. So um, while these uh, were all six cases of CVST, um, the, 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 the thromboses were not just limited um, to the, uh, the, the, the cerebral um, venous drainage system. Um, in three of these cases, there were substantial clots and other large um, vessels in other parts of the body. For example, portal vein and right pulmonary artery. Um, another individual had bilateral lower extremity um, venous thrombal uh, embolisms, uh, right internal jugular vein, and portal vein. Um, and this is also consistent with what was observed uh, in the, the cases after the AstraZeneca vaccine in, in Europe. And it has also um, caused us to, I think, in the future, cast a little wider net where we're, we're going to be looking for um, thromboses in the presence of thrombocytopenia. Certainly most of these cases so far have been CVST, um, but, but that, uh, we don't think that that doesn't mean that the, the, the only thing we should be looking for is CVST. Um, we think it's important to look for um, substantial blood clots in individuals with thr thrombocytopenia, regardless of whether they're in the, the CNS or not. Next slide. So this is showing um, SARS-CoV-2 test results among these patients. And I show the slide just to mention it, it's, it, it looks pretty unremarkable. Um, there is some evidence that um, COVID-19 may place you at risk for um, thrombotic events. In these individuals, um, the viral testing was negative, and then the serology um, was either negative or and, and, and three of them was not documented. Next slide. Here are the hematology results among the patients. Um, you can see all of them uh, were thrombocytopenic and um, many of them were um, severely thrombocytopenic, so platelets less than 50. And then for the platelet factor four heparin induced thrombocytopenia, five out of the six, uh, uh, the, the antibody test results, five out of the six were positive and in one patient it was not done. Next slide. So treatments um, for these patients um, did get heparin. Um, uh, Non-heparin anticoagulants were given in five. Three patients got platelets and three got IVIG. Um, there was one death. And um, of the most recent information that we have, three remain hospitalized, two in intensive care, and two were discharged home. Next slide. So here's some uh, early analysis of our observed versus expected. 
and I I, I, I want to mention that um, this this is a, a relatively crude analysis, although I, I, I do think it, it demonstrates, it gives you a, a good picture of of what we're seeing for observers is expected. Looking at calculating individual person time, and I think we'll be able to uh, do a more sophisticated analysis and get um, get some more accurate data on observed versus expected. But in the interim, we wanted to um, conduct this analysis and um, a review of the literature. Through the review of the literature. Um, we estimated the annual incidence of CVST of 0.5 to 2 cases per 100,000 population. Um, now, we assumed a risk period of 5.6% of a calendar year. So the way we did that is we looked at our analytic period, which is basically March 2nd through April 12th, um, so 40, 41 days. Um, we assumed that people... Um, contributed person time for roughly half of that time. We, we didn't know at this state, at this point, when people got vaccinated or came into the cohort. So we had to make an assumption. We just decided to put that at the midpoint. So we divide that 41 days by two um, to get the person time. And then we divide by 365 um, to annualize that. Um, doses administered among women in the 20 to 50 year old age group, which is where we saw the cases. Um, was just over 1.4 million doses. On this table here, you see is uh, is several um, estimates of reporting uh, rate ratio based on uh, annual estimated annual incidents. Again, uh, we estimated annual incidents 0.5 to 2 per 100,000. So we're just splitting that out in increments of 0.5, uh, and um, a, just a doing the arithmetic, we're able to calculate our expected cases in women aged 20 to 50 years. So we have an observed, that's six. So we're just basically, we're dividing six by the expected cases in women aged 20 to 50. And this is a bit of a sensitivity analysis based on what you think the, the incidence might be. And you can see the reporting ratio, the reporting um, ratios for um, the age group, uh, age sex stratified group at risk ranges anywhere from three point, a low of 3.8 to a high of up to about 15. Next slide. Next slide. So to summarize our findings, um, CVST is rare, but clinically serious and can result in substantial morbidity and mortality. It is not usually associated with thrombocytopenia. This is unusual. Um, the observed cases following Janssen COVID-19 vaccine appear to exceed expected based on background rates of CVST among women aged 20 to 50 years. Actually, can you go back to the previous slide? So I wanna, I, I, I wanna, uh, I neglected to mention that um, these expected rates are these expected cases are based on CVST in general. Um, and again, we're looking at, a, at an even more unusual um, form of CVST. This is CVST in the presence of thrombocytopenia. Um, again, there really isn't enough data that we're comfortable um, esti you know, estimating an incidence of this very specific, um, this very specific condition in this very specific age and sex group. So um, th these are CVST cases and expected cases in general. Um, so you can almost make an argument that these reporting ratios are on are are, are basically biased towards um, lower. Um, again, because this condition is, is 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 likely so rare. Next slide. Next slide. I'm sorry about that diversion there. So the observed. Cases of following Jack uh, Janssen COVID-19 vaccine appear to be appear to exceed expected based on background rates in women aged 20 to 50 um, are, are at least a threefold or greater. Um, all six reports were in women aged 18 to 48, all with thrombocytopenia. There were no obvious patterns of risk factors detected. 
Uh, CVST with thrombocytopenia has not been observed after the two authorized mRNA vaccines. It's actually been just over 182 million mRNA COVID-19 vaccine doses administered with no reported cases of this condition to date. The clinical features of Janssen cases are similar to those observed following the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine in Europe. And both Janssen and AstraZeneca vaccines contain replication and competent adenoviral vectors, um, human for the Janssen and chimpanzee for AstraZeneca. Next slide. So this is straight off the Han, um, and this is more of a, of a reference slide, but a couple key points for clinicians. Um, we're asking that they maintain a high index of suspicion for symptoms that might represent serious thrombotic events or thrombocytopenia in patients who have recently received the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. And importantly, do not treat patients with thrombotic events and thrombocytopenia following receipt of Janssen COVID-19 vaccine with heparin unless HIT testing is negative. Next slide. Um, just a, a, a reminder for, for public health officials and to, the, to encourage healthcare providers um, to report to VAERS, <clears throat> and then some awareness messages for the public. Next slide. So I want to emphasize how important it is to report to VAERS, especially um, these clinically serious and unexpected adverse events occurring after vaccine. And here you have the uh, information for reporting to VAERS and how you can get help want to mention to our healthcare provider partners out there on the front lines, um, you know, we value, um, we value the work you're doing. We value as partners in vaccine safety. Um, we really view you as our eyes and ears out there um, to help us detect potential safety problems so we can rapidly assess them and um, make evidence-based um, public health decisions. I want to mention that it is important um, if you do report an adverse event and you are contacted by VAERS or by CDC to um, please send records as soon as possible. Um, I just want to um, reassure you that HIPAA permits reporting of protected health information to public health authorities. We are conducting um, a public health function and there are uh, th there should be no concerns about um, about reporting um, medical records to us so we can um, do an in-depth review of these um, and, and get a handle on what's going on with vaccine safety. Next slide. So our next steps are to continue enhanced monitoring in VAERS and other vaccine safety systems, such as the vaccine safety data link. I'll just mention that in, in VSD, we, we don't have that much Janssen doses administered, only 113,000. We have no cases of CVSD in the risk interval. We will investigate potential cases through detailed clinical reviews and chart reviews, and we are in the process um, of, of assisting FDA to refine the analysis to better quantify risk. Next slide. I wish to acknowledge uh, the following um, groups for, um, for helping with this presentation. Next slide. I'll be happy to take questions. So uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Shimabukuro, for another very um, uh, detailed and um, easy to understand presentation. Um, we're going to hold questions at this time um, until um, uh, the next, after the next presentation. So um, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Lee, who is the um, uh, VAST co-chair and uh, member of the ACIP and the working group, uh, for COVID vaccine to please come forward and to uh, talk about the VAST assessment. Uh, Dr. Dr. Lee? Dr. Romero, this is uh, Amanda Cohn. I just wanted to uh, uh, address the persons who may be on the phone and waiting to do the public comment that we are running late for the public comment session. Um, I anticipate that we'll uh, delay the public comment session till about 4 p.m. Sorry, go ahead, Dr. That's 4 Lee. PM, that's, that's 4 p.m. Eastern Eastern time. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, is, is, uh, Dr. Lee, please. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks to Dr. Shima Bakoro for um, that uh, excellent presentation. Next slide. 
Uh, I just wanted to remind folks that the VAST or the Vaccine Safety Technical Subgroup's role is to review, evaluate, and interpret the post-authorization, post-approval COVID-19 vaccine safety data as it's coming in to serve as a central hub for technical subject matter expertise from federal agencies conducting um, this post-approval of safety monitoring to advise on analyses, interpretation, and data presentation, and to provide updates to the ACIP COVID-19 Vaccines Working Group and the full ACIP on COVID-19 vaccine safety. Next slide. We have met 30 times in total, including 14 meetings pre-authorization and 16 meetings post-authorization or post-recommendation. As a reminder, the mRNA vaccines were recommended for use on December 12th and December 19th, and the first adenovector vaccine was recommended for use in the U.S. on February 28th, with the first doses being shipped on March 2nd to jurisdictions. Next slide. Uh, I wanted to just recount the, um, uh, the events of the last 48 hours. Um, so VAST met to review the data on CVST on Monday, April 12th. Um, at our last meeting um, on Monday, the data from what were presented from VAERS through April 10th, 2021, uh, there were three cases at that time following Moderna vaccine without thrombocytopenia with 83 million doses administered, zero cases following Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine with 95 million doses administered, and six cases following the Johnson vaccine with, with thrombocytopenia, CVST with thrombocytopenia, uh, with approximately 6 million doses administered. Next slide. Uh, VAST noted that the characteristics of the cases following the Johnson vaccine were similar to those following the AstraZeneca vaccine, including evidence of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia, elevated D-dimer, and antibodies to platelet factor four, where that data were available. Um, these cases were also similar in terms of age group, female predominance, and timing of onset within two weeks of vaccine receipt. All uh, Janssen cases occurred in white individuals. We do not yet have any specific information about race ethnicity in the AstraZeneca cases. Um, a couple of uh, other items to note uh, are that the data that VAST reviewed really only focused on the cases, which uh, is really numerator-only data. In order to estimate risks and factors associated with CVST with thrombocytopenia, we really need to also understand the denominator data, which is forthcoming. I also want to emphasize that this is a quickly evolving situation. Um, it has only been 48 hours, and uh, continue to learn uh, new details even during today's presentation. So, uh, and, you know, appreciate everyone's continued vigilance and work in uh, uh, rapidly investigating this uh, potential safety signal. Next slide. After the April 12th meeting, the VAST subgroup discussed these findings um, uh, in our uh, usual uh, independent fashion and expressed the following based on the review of the data. First, that CVST is a rare but serious potential adverse event following vaccination, that the risk factors are not yet well understood based on these case reports. Uh, VAST members expressed their concern about delayed recognition of this new entity. CVST with thrombocytopenia is fairly unusual, and VAST felt strongly that early recognition was critical for timely and appropriate management including the use of IVIG and anticoagulation with non-heparin-based therapies. Next slide. Uh, vaccine safety is paramount to all of us. Uh, in this situation, we are really appreciative that our uh, global safety monitoring efforts and uh, the VAERS team enabled the CDC and FDA to rapidly detect these adverse events. Uh, information, uh, or VAST felt that information about this potential life-threatening adverse event should be promptly provided to clinicians in order to enhance early recognition and appropriate treatment of persons who develop thrombosis with thrombocytopenia following vaccination. Next slide. And on the 12th, um, 
There was also discussion that further evaluation of the benefit risk balance of using the Janssen vaccine in specific subgroups would be warranted. Um, other vaccines are currently available for use in the U.S. for the prevention of COVID-19. And that timely and transparent communication with healthcare providers and the public is crucial to maintain confidence in the vaccination program. Next slide. And within 24 hours of that discussion, our colleagues at CDC and FDA communicated these findings to providers and to the public, as you heard. Next slide. Going forward, VAST plans to focus on enhanced case identification, including uh, for those patients who are recently vaccinated with the Janssen vaccine. We continue to encourage patients to enroll in Be Safe and for providers and patients to report to VAERS, as Dr. Shimabukuro mentioned. This is incredibly helpful for all of us, um, and uh, you know, we hope to continue to support uh, vaccine safety monitoring. Um, we also will proceed with our, our typical signal investigation process that includes three phases. The first phase is signal identification, which has already happened here. The second phase is signal refinement, which includes a series of steps to evaluate the magnitude and clinical significance of a suspected association. And the third phase is signal evaluation, which often consists of formal epidemiologic analyses to more definitively establish or refute causality. Next slide. The signal refinement phase for CVST with thrombocytopenia will include a review of findings in other vaccine safety surveillance systems uh, and an assessment of the risk of developing CVST in various subgroups in order to inform risk mitigation strategies and support decision making. VAST will continue to review all safety data from uh, the U.S. COVID-19 vaccination program and any data that are also made available to us for review outside the U.S. And we will continue to update the ACIP COVID-19 vaccines work group, the ACIP secretariat, and the full ACIP on a regular basis. Next slide. Just wanted to take a moment to thank our VAST members for their hard work and continued vigilance over the past four months, um, and our federal colleagues, and especially CDC and FDA with this particular signal investigation, and for their continued dedication to vaccine safety. Um, and I also just wanted to thank our uh, Janssen colleagues for their collaboration uh, on ensuring that we maintain trust and confidence in vaccines and in public health. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to conclude and turn it back to you, Dr. Romero. Thank you, Dr. Lee. So um, what we'll do at this point is open up uh, the last uh, presentation uh, for uh, questions. Um, and uh, if necessary, we will break so that uh, the public comment session uh, will uh, go forward and then come back if there are still more questions. So let's start with um, the voting members, please. Uh, Dr. Alt, I see your hand is up. Dr. Romero. Yes, I had a question. Uh, yes, Dr. Cohn. I also just want to let you know that there's one more presentation that we have before public comment. Ah, I'm sorry. That's yes. okay. You, you are correct. So uh, let's is, take some comments, uh, the questions now, please. Go ahead. This is a question for Dr. Lee about slide number six. It occurred to me while I was looking at that uh, slide that we don't usually, ACIP doesn't interact with emergency room physicians, hematologists inpatient hospitalists and a bunch of other groups that might, uh, maybe it was a different slide number. You were, uh, you know, we're not interacting with people who are going to have to make these decisions. What are we doing to get the word out to groups that might be in a position where they need to do timely management and that type of thing? Happy to um, uh, cede uh, my time to our CDC colleagues, but we really, you know, uh, look to our uh, both CDC and our partner organizations around the table, many of whom communicate with our provider communities, uh, as well as our public health colleagues who have also put out state hands to ensure that this information expeditiously gets to all individuals. Um, and also, you know, I'm hoping that this open meeting will help uh, uh, stimulate uh, the necessary attention to ensure that we are um, uh, providing 
timely diagnosis and management of these cases. And Dr. Alt, this is Amanda. I just will add that we do have a COCA pl call planned uh, to do some additional outreach to uh, clinical providers uh, for tomorrow. Um, and we will continue to um, resend out an alert um, in all of our uh, uh, many emergency response ways uh, to uh, emergency room providers as well as primary care doctors and other uh, healthcare providers uh, about uh, what to look for uh, as well as how to immediately manage uh, uh, any um, potential cases. Thank you. Ms. Bata. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Um, I don't know if you can share this data, Dr. Shimabakuro, but was the death, was that associated with heparin treatment? Um, and, and can we attribute that to heparin treatment? And then um, not working in a hospital or in the clinic setting, I'm wondering how available is the PS4 ELISA um, test for antibodies? Is Dr. Broder on the call? Did, she may um, be able is, to give... Yeah, can you take that, or do you, have, do you know the answer to that first question? Well, the, the first question, um, at this point, um, we're, we're, we're just trying to, this is uh, Karen Broder from the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project. Good afternoon. And I work in the Immunization Safety Office. Um, for the case that, unfortunate case that died, um, we're trying to learn about the case. Um, we really um, are, are not in a, in a situation where we're looking specifically um, at the cause of death, um, and we, we defer that to the jurisdictions. Um, I will say that in reviewing the cases in general, it does appear that a number of cases um, were, were initially treated with heparin, um, and that is one of the reasons why the um, health alert network and message of communication has gone out to ensure that people are more aware of this um, this condition and that heparin um, is not to be used um, unless hit, uh, the uh, HIT testing is negative. Thank you. With respect to the second question, um, uh, to the best of my knowledge, this HIT testing is an available test um, in, in um, hospitals, but I am not uh, aware of the uh, nature of the availability um, in all the regions. Uh, and I would, uh, there may be experts on the call that could better address that question. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bernstein, please. Uh, thank you. I had a uh, question for Dr. Shimon Bakura and one for Dr. Lee. Um, first, Dr. Shimon Bakura, fabulous presentation as always. Can you go to slides 20 and 21, please? Uh, next slide, sorry. So this slide under treatment, it says that four patients uh, four of the six received heparin. And then if you go back to the previous slide, there's five patients were antibody test result positive. Um, it, it, does that make sense or is there, am I misinterpreting? Shouldn't uh, five of them have been uh, treated with heparin to have a heparin induced thrombocytopenia? That's not what induced. I don't, I think those are separate. I, I, I think that um, the, uh, I think that this, um, th this, this phenomenon occurs um, as prior to them actually getting, in this case at least, prior to them getting treated with heparin. Um, I think I would ask Karen or Dr. Broder if she, um, she may have a better idea of kind of the, the, the mechanism or the pathophysiology of, uh, of this condition. Uh, yeah, Tom, this is Karen. Again, I would certainly defer to experts, but it is my understanding that the, the, the use of heparin is, is not going to uh, trigger a, a test positive immediately, and that the, the idea of the thought is that this may be a similar mechanism to what Dr. Bell uh, described earlier, where this, this test is positive uh, due to the effects of the vaccine, um, and, and that is um, uh, the, the giving of heparin may just exaggerate the situation and make it worse. Certainly would defer to other colleagues with uh, additional expertise in the topic, um, potentially uh, on the call. Thank you. 
Thanks. And then the question, Tom, about um, since we're trying to uh, study uh, children and de-escalating it by uh, age, I was wondering at what do we have background rates for CVST in, uh, in children? Because we're doing immunobridging, but I don't know about immunosafety or whatever. I, I believe we do have background rates. I don't have them um, in my presentation, and I would have to get back to you on, on some of the specifics of what these, what these rates are by age and by sex. Okay, that that would be interesting since we do want to involve uh, children vaccinated as well. And then uh, for Dr. Lee, I, if there's 106 AstraZeneca cases so far and uh, six uh, Janssen, Johnson & Johnson, are the number of cases between these two viral vector vaccines attributable to the overall number of doses that have been administered? Or is there a difference between chimp and human and no? Um, I think many of those questions are ones that we, um, so number one, about mechanism of action, and uh, number two, making sure we have clarity on the denominators um, uh, in terms of, um, you know, who has received these vaccines. As we know, the allocation strategies in our country and in other countries um, may mean that the individuals who are exposed to these vaccines um, the denominators might um, differ. And so that's where I think that additional information will be helpful. I just did also want to emphasize on the earlier point that um, if somebody has um, an anti-PF4 uh, antibody, I think the concern being that heparin would not be an appropriate treatment for use and that um, other anticoagulation therapies would be indicated if they had the presence of this particular antibody, and that it's not necessarily the exposure to heparin during this admission that's creating that positivity. It's um, sort of an indicator or a marker of potential um, uh, an immune response uh, that is um, uh, facilitating this thrombocytopenia and associated thrombosis. I think that is the, the question. The main point to get across being that that diagnostic test is helpful to know whether or not it's safe to use heparin. This is Tom. I, that was much more elegantly stated than than my response. So yes, I completely agree with uh, Dr. Lee on that. So that's the make, using it as a screening is so critically important. Thank you. Okay, so um, I see that Dr. Dushan has been patiently um, keeping his hand raised, and Dr. Green also uh, has um, raised her hand. Um, so what we're going to do now is uh, take. Dr. Long's question, then we're going to proceed to Dr. Oliver's presentation and then return to questions um, if, if time allots or go to the public comment and then return to, to questions. I'm sorry that's so convoluted, but uh, we're not rushing this. We want to give everybody a chance. So, uh, Dr. Long, please go forward. Yes, um, the first, it, it's for Dr. Shimabakura. Um, the first uh, would be the thought that the thrombocytopenia is causing the thrombosis is is not likely the horse in the cart correctly, but is a manifestation either of destruction of platelets in the thrombosis um, uh, event or of microvasculopathy or platelets that have antibody on them. Antibody, antibody on them are very sticky, et cetera. So there are a lot of potential things, but I, I, I don't think that we want people to think that the thrombocytopenia is causing the clot. It's a risk for bleeding associated with the, the clots. But the part about the cerebral venous thrombosis is seemingly special to me for this vaccine. Uh, you know, we see lots and lots of people who get lots and lots of clots uh, who have platelet antibodies who have um, atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura, and it's not cerebral venous thrombosis. So I, that, I, I think, could be another special thing about this. My specific question for you is uh, twofold. One is, with the number of doses administered so far of the Janssen product, um, do we have time to have the reporting of adverse events from the majority or 
almost all of those doses, it seems unlikely that we may learn more. It's likely that we may learn more in the next two or four weeks, as well as people recognizing they may have a case of this and didn't really uh, put it together with the vaccine. That's the first question. Do we know the whole story? Or during this pause, is there still more information we're going to learn? And the second is um, the inference of white women uh, might, inf might infer that uh, people of color, women of color, are not at risk. And I wonder if we know anything about the vaccine distribution to white women versus uh, uh, non-white women. Tom, this is uh, Sarah Oliver. I'll let you know. I have both of those points in my presentation, if that saves you from I should have known. <laughs> answering the question. Thank you. Sure. So, Dr. Okay. Um, is, there, is there anything else, uh, Dr. Long? Okay, so what we're going to do next then, uh, Dr. Cohn, did I hear your voice a minute ago? I was just going to say, I was just going to recommend we do Dr. Uh, Oliver's presentation, then come yes. back to Dr. Dushevin. Yeah. I exactly, Dr. Cohn. So um, uh, please, um, Dr. Oliver, um, who is uh, the, uh, the lead for the um, COVID-19 work group, uh, she's going to present uh, work group interpretation. Uh, Dr. Oliver, please. And then we will come back uh, to um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dushin uh, and Dries. Uh, thank you so much and good afternoon. Next slide. So in this presentation, we're going to walk through the overall risk benefit balance for the use of the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine that's been discussed by the work group. This includes a review of the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis or CVST cases, the risk of COVID disease by age and sex, COVID-19 vaccines administered by age, Janssen vaccine doses administered to date, and projected supply of COVID-19 vaccines in the US. Then the work group discussed policy options for updated recommendations for use of the Janssen vaccine, and we'll walk through those as well. Next slide. So the work group reviewed six cases of CVST reported to VAERS, all six among women 18 to 48 years of age, with the interval from vaccine receipt to symptom onset ranging from six to 13 days. And these cases have been described in detail previously. We also discussed the case of CVST reported in the Janssen phase three trial in a 25 year old male. The Janssen presentation described these case details as well, but the symptoms developed nine days after vaccination and on day 21 post-vaccine was diagnosed with CVST and ultimately found to be antiplatelet factor four antibody positive. Next slide. So next we'll walk through overall COVID epi. The exact risk factors for CVST are unknown. So it's difficult to highlight the epi among the specific population at risk for this uh, CVST with thrombocytopenia, but we'll discuss epi by several possible factors that could be associated with these cases. First, the slide shows COVID cases and deaths by sex. Overall, females represent a slightly higher proportion of overall cases on the left in blue, but a slightly smaller proportion of COVID deaths in red on the right. Next slide. So this slide shows COVID cases by age group. The bars in blue show percent of cases by age. You can see that the younger age group, this 18 to 29 years, actually represents a higher proportion of COVID cases relative to the percent of the US population shown in gray. Next slide. This slide shows COVID associated hospitalizations by age and throughout the pandemic. You can see that the oldest population in dark blue on the bottom has represented a larger proportion of hospitalizations throughout the year compared to the younger populations. Next slide. And finally, COVID-19 deaths by age. I think we're all well aware now, but the oldest age population shown here on the bottom represents a substantial proportion of deaths from COVID relative to the younger population. Next slide. So next we'll move to COVID vaccination coverage by age. You can see that here among the oldest population, those 65 and older, nearly 80% of the population has received at least one dose. 
40 to 50 percent of adults 40 to 64 years of age have received at least one dose and 25 to 30 percent of those 18 to 39 years of age have received at least one dose of a COVID vaccine. So this highlights the proportion of the population who is yet to be vaccinated with any of our COVID-19 vaccines and the population to be most impacted by future recommendations. Next slide. This shows the number of doses administered to adults by age group, showing millions of adults uh, uh, who are fully vaccinated and partially vaccinated by age group. Uh, in uh, fully vaccinated in blue and partially vaccinated in red. Next slide. So next, specifically moving to the Janssen doses administered uh, by date, there have been over 7.2 million doses of the Janssen vaccine. If we limit to the population um, 18 to 50 years of, uh, to the female population 18 to 15 years of age, uh, we can see that there have been approximately 1.5 million doses to date. Next slide. And to get to the question that was asked earlier, um, this is breaking down Janssen vaccines administered by various populations. You can see from male to female, there's been a relatively even split by age. The time, uh, given the time that this vaccine rolled out, only 18% of doses were administered to those 65 years of age and older. The majority of doses have been given to adults 18 to 50 or 50 to 64 years of age. And then race and ethnicity is listed here as well. Um, there is uh, a proportion where we don't have uh, race and ethnicity available, but of, of doses where we do know, uh, you can see around 60% were administered to, uh, to white non-Hispanic individuals, uh, and the remaining proportion uh, distributed is shown here. Next slide. So there was another way that the work group thought through these doses administered. So from currently available data, these thrombocytopenic thrombotic events developed six to 13 days after vaccine receipt. We know that there are around 7.2 million doses administered. So if we think through doses from the beginning of the program, uh, the Janssen program in early March through March 30th, there are around 3.4 million doses, or around 48% of doses uh, administered. If we think through a, a risk window of up to two weeks after doses were administered, it's likely that if these cases, if these vaccine recipients were to develop thrombocytopenic thrombotic events post-vaccine, then they would have likely already occurred. However, if we think through doses administered within the last two weeks, shown here on the right, from March 30th to April 13th, 3.7 million doses have been administered or 52% of doses have been given within the last two weeks. Therefore, the thrombocytopenic thrombotic events post-vaccine may still occur after these doses as these individuals would still remain within their risk window. Next slide. So next, moving to overall COVID-19 vaccine supply considerations. For mRNA vaccines, we expect somewhere around 14 million first doses of Pfizer and Moderna vaccines each week, hopefully without any substantial interruptions expected. For the Janssen vaccines, to date, Janssen vaccine comprises less than 5% of the vaccines administered. Although I will note that this program started in March compared to December with the mRNA vaccines. There are approximately 13 million doses of Janssen vaccines currently available, around 3.6 million doses that would be available to order, and around 9.2 million doses that are currently available at administration sites. In addition, there may be an additional 11 million doses by the end of April. We did want to highlight that while doses for the Janssen vaccine may be less than for the mRNA vaccines overall, we highlight that the Janssen vaccine has occasionally been used in populations that may be difficult to reach with mRNA vaccines that would require freezer temperatures or two doses. Next slide. So then trying to summarize what we know so far, thrombocytopenic thrombotic events have occurred after the AstraZeneca vaccine. In the US, six cases of CVST and thrombocytopenia have been reported after authorization 
and receipt of the Janssen vaccine. No cases of CVST with thrombocytopenia have been reported after receipt of either Pfizer or Moderna vaccines. These CVST cases have primarily occurred in younger adults and in females. CVST can be clinically devastating or fatal. Then we wanted to highlight that in the US, alternative COVID-19 vaccines, the mRNA vaccines are available. And based on current uh, projections, supply of both vaccines are expected to be relatively stable in the near future. Therefore, the decision isn't necessarily receipt of a Janssen vaccine versus remaining at risk of COVID. The decision may be receipt of a Janssen vaccine versus receipt of another uh, mRNA vaccine. Next slide. We also wanted to highlight what we do not know. Currently, we don't know the true background incidence of CVST with thrombocytopenia. We don't know the specific risk factors for these thrombocytopenic thrombotic events. We don't know the incidence of other thrombotic cases with thrombocytopenia, so non-CVST, after the Janssen vaccine. We don't know the ability to compare or generalize the thrombotic cases seen after the AstraZeneca vaccine to the Janssen vaccine cases. And finally, we don't know the true incidence of thrombocytopenic events, uh, thrombotic events after Janssen vaccine, as there may be more cases identified in the coming days to weeks. Next slide. So now we'll move to the policy options for the use of the Janssen vaccine. Next slide. The work group had several discussion points overall. First, while the reported CVST cases are rare, once limited to doses administered to the age and sex of CVST cases, the observed cases exceed except expected cases. Given the timing of doses administered, additional cases may be identified over the next one to two weeks. And then finally, an emphasis that robust safety surveillance is critical. The fact that we're having these discussions so quickly after the cases demonstrate that signal detection and evaluation of cases occurred as planned, moving to public discussion of these safety issues and policy implications as soon as possible. Next slide. So there's a spectrum of policy options available for the Janssen vaccine. ACIP could decide that the risks outweigh the benefits and vote to not recommend use of the Janssen vaccine due to these safety concerns. ACIP could also decide that the benefits outweigh the risks overall and recommend use of the vaccine in all adults 18 years of age and older. Next slide. But the work group also discussed something in the middle of the spectrum as well recommending use of the Janssen vaccine in some populations with age or gender specific recommendations, such as adults 50 years of age and older or males only. Next slide. So I'm gonna walk through some of the work group discussions for each of these points. First, for sex or gender based recommendations, the work group was concerned that these would be quite difficult to implement uh, and was not terribly supportive of this policy option. Next, for age-based recommendations, there was concern that we may not have sufficient data at this time to inform a specific age cutoff. However, the work group acknowledged that many countries in Europe have used an age-based approach for the AstraZeneca vaccine recommendations. And overall, it would allow additional options, a choice of an mRNA or an advector vaccine in an older population that's at risk for COVID. Next slide. So then the work group also discussed the possibility of extending the pause while awaiting for additional information. This could potentially allow for a more informed specific recommendations for the Janssen vaccine. We could evaluate the risk by age and inform possible age-based recommendation. It would also allow for further assessment to see if the thrombocytopenic thrombotic risk extends beyond CVST cases. However, extension of the pause could have broad consequences. Individuals may want to receive the Janssen vaccine. In addition, a pause could have global implications, 
such as pausing clinical trials or limiting the ability of the Janssen vaccine in other countries with more limited vaccine supply. The work group had a full discussion around these policy options yesterday and favored extending the pause for a limited period of time while awaiting additional information. Next slide. So to move to specific recommendations, at the top here is the previous Janssen vote and recommendation for reference. Then we're proposing two questions to ACIP to discuss. Does ACIP have enough information to make interim age or risk factor based recommendations for the use of the Janssen vaccine? We want to acknowledge that these recommendations would be interim and could be updated as needed. And then what recommendation does ACIP, ACIP feel is appropriate today, given the current available information for use of the Janssen vaccine? The pause issued by FDA and CDC was only until ACIP discussed today. There are two things before we open up for discussion. First, I need to thank the many people who helped pull this information for the work group yesterday in the meeting today in just a matter of hours. It is absolutely a team effort. Um, and then I want um, to uh, toss to Dr. Fink from FDA um, to present FDA's thoughts on this before we open up to ACIP member discussions. Dr. Fink. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. On behalf of FDA, I would sincerely like to thank the ACIP and the COVID vaccines work group for today's informative presentations and what I'm sure will be a thoughtful discussion of this safety signal and considerations for a path forward. As we work to better understand the nature of this signal, including potential mechanisms and risk factors, FDA will continue to collaborate closely with CDC to collect and evaluate information as it becomes available, and will also continue to collaborate closely with our regulatory and public health counterparts outside the U.S to leverage their experience with the similar safety signal observed with the AstraZeneca vaccine. The pause recommended yesterday morning out of an abundance of caution has raised national awareness of the safety concern and has provided time and opportunity to carefully and collectively evaluate the information at hand and to formulate questions that remain to be addressed. In FDA's ongoing assessment of these rare but serious thromboembolic events with thrombocytopenia, our current thinking is that this risk could be managed by inclusion of warning statements in the EUA fact sheets along with coordinated communications from FDA, CDC, and others to inform healthcare providers and vaccine recipients of the potential risk and symptoms that should warrant medical evaluation as well as advice to ensure proper diagnosis and management of the condition and reporting of any additional cases. With such information available, FDA appreciates that individuals in consultation with their healthcare providers or vaccination providers may arrive at a conclusion of favorable benefit risk after taking into account demographic factors, risk of exposure to SARS-CoV-2 and severe outcomes from COVID-19 and access to other authorized COVID vaccines. Consequently, this risk management approach could be considered to allow for further assessment of the safety signal concurrent with resuming use of the Johnson COVID vaccine in individuals or populations for whom the benefits of the vaccine continue to outweigh the risk. Thank you very much. Thank you for those comments. <clears throat> Um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Oliver, for another outstanding presentation. Um, Dr. Cohen, a question for you. Um, the uh, public uh, comment session had been delayed, and uh, you mentioned that we were going to try to do it at 4 p.m. Eastern uh, time. Do you want to proceed to the public comment session, or do you want to take questions at this moment for um, uh, Dr. Oliver's presentation? Um, Dr. Romero, could we do, um, could we wait, uh, take questions till 4.10 and then take a five minute break and do public comment at 4.15? So questions until 4.10, then a break and then comment. And then discussion after. Very good. So um, great. Then this, uh, these presentations are open for discussion. Um, and um, let me go back um, to uh, Dr. Dushan to see if he wants to ask his question, followed by Dr. Grease. 
Thank you, Dr. Romero. I still remember my question. It's for um, uh, Dr. Shimu Bukuru. And I'm curious if um, it's possible to have an estimate, any sort of ballpark estimate of the time frame that, um, you know, in, in which we could learn more about the potential safety signal from non-CVST thromboses associated with um, low platelets to uh, get a better picture of um, what a potential, um, you know, syndrome might be that's associated with this vaccine. And then secondly, is there any role for VSAFE in telling us anything about this um, potential issue? Thank you. Dr. Dushin, can you repeat the first part of your first question again? Yes. Um, if there's any way to estimate, you know, a ballpark time frame that um, would allow us to understand whether there's a safety signal associated with non-CVST um, thrombotic disease with low platelets. Um, that, that may be difficult to say because it, it's such a rare condition in, in, in general. Um, we, we are reviewing every potential case that, that, that comes in, and one of the things we're looking for in, in the report and in the medical records is low platelets. So, um, we, I mean, we are able to identify um, cases with thrombocytopenia and cases with, without thrombocytopenia. We're also, we also have other um, uh, adverse events of special interest that I think we're going to look at a little differently, like um, PE and or pulmonary embolism and, and uh, venothrombus, venothrombus embolism. Um, and uh, so I, I, I do think that, um, you know, now that we're aware of this uh, unusual condition of thrombotic events in the presence of thrombocytopenia, we, we are going to reevaluate how, how we do our, 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 our surveillance to, to try to get a better idea of what's happening with these reports. Um, but I'm not sure if I can put a specific timeline on that at this point. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Anything, anything we can learn from VSAFE? Um, I think the the main benefit from VSAFE may be um, to to um, get these reports in into VARES. Uh, I will say for for these specific for these specific reports, these individuals are are, are quite ill or and in the hospital and in the ICU. Um, so so probably they're not reporting for them themselves. Um, they're not able to actually submit a report. Um, and uh, and the the initial presenting system symptoms like headache and fatigue are, are quite common and maybe less useful. Um, I think for a for a rare serious condition like this, um, the vaccine adverse event reporting system, um, as demonstrated, is the system that's going to be able to rapidly detect um, and evaluate these these initial um, reports. And I just want to um, emphasize again. Um, our partnership with healthcare providers uh, out, out there um, seeing patients, recognizing potential adverse events and reporting them in, and then, um, you know, working with us to access medical records so we can um, further evaluate these these rare um, and, and, and serious adverse events. But I, um, as Dr. Oliver said, and as I said, I think this is a good example of the system working um, a good example of how robust the system is and uh, a good example of how um, the U.S. vaccine safety system is able to rapidly detect rare serious events and assess them. Thank you. Dr. Dries, do you want to ask your question? Yes, thank you. I was actually just trying to reply to a couple of the questions that were raised during the earlier discussion. The first was the question about the communication of the information in the Han. Um, and I just wanted to endorse what Dr. Lee had replied, which is that the distribution system for the Han alerts is actually, you know, pretty robust. Um, and, you know, and we certainly have communicated that information out, you know, to the emergency department, the hematologists, et cetera. And honestly, even before the Han was released, we were already getting questions from PCPs, from patients, from the emergency department. And so we do really appreciate um, how quickly the Han was released um, and the level of clinical detail and guidance that was in the Han. Um, 
The second question was around the availability of the, the testing, the heparin-induced antibody testing. And that was really one of my first tasks when I got the Han was to figure out what is this test and do we have it? Um, and just, you know, to use my own institution as an example, you know, we are a large, you know, clinical um, laboratory that's, I think, fairly sophisticated, um, but we do not have that test on site. We use it, uh, we send it out um, with a minimum of a 48-hour uh, turnaround time. So I would anticipate that the majority of hospitals in the, in the country would have to uh, send out uh, to get availability of that test. Thank you. Can I ask a question to follow up that you may not know, but um, are reference laboratories able to scale up uh, testing for this if there's a, if there's a surge in, in request for this test? Yeah, I, I certainly don't have the answer to that. I don't know how many different reference laboratories are typically used by community hospitals, um, and it is a fairly specialized test, so I would, I would imagine the demand is going to increase. Um, quickly. Thank you for that information. Um, uh, let's go to D Dr. Uh, Kimberlin. Dr. Kimberlin, please. Uh, yes, David Kimberlin, AAP Red Book. This is a question for Dr. Shima Vakura. Um, on the first of your summary slides, it was slide 24 in, in your slide set, there's a, a key summary, I think, at least for me, um, that the, um, r the observed rate was threefold or greater the expected rate can you point me to where that is in your in your presentation? I want to make sure I'm I understand exactly what it is we're looking at. Uh, if you can go to slide 22. So this is this is an observed versus expected. So I mean the observed in this case is six. We've observed six cases in the in the analytic period, and then we do the calculations above to get to how many expected cases, um, how many cases we would expect to see in women 20 to 50 year, years old um, in the same analytic period. And so this is basically six divided by 1.58 comes out to 3.8. And, and we do this for different estimated annual incidences because there's a, there's a range of incidences. That's what you're seeing there, at least three, possibly up to 15. So the calculated observed is the far right column, the expected is the middle column. <laughs> No, the, the, the observed is six. I, the, the, we, we have six cases in the analytic period. I guess I should have added in a column. So the observed is, is six for everything. The expected varies based on the a estimated annual incidence. Um, and so it's, it's basically six divided by 1.58 equals 3.8, six divided by 1.18 equals 5.1. Um, I, 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 I see where that's confusing. We should have put in the observed is just six because that's what we've observed. I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Shaw. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Yerev Shaw from ASTO and from the State of Maine CDC. Uh, Dr. Shima Bakuro, actually, my question pertains to this slide as well. Recognizing that you and your colleagues at FDA are refining this analysis, I did have a question in connection with your, your choice of denominator here. Uh, I note, and as noted on the third bullet, uh, you, you, you restricted the, the denominator to doses administered among women aged 20 to 50. I was curious about that, recognizing that epidemiologists often disagree on denominator choices. Uh, it seemed plausible that your denominator could have been all recipients of the vaccine, uh, irrespective of their age, given that in the clinical trials, there was one male uh, with CVST, and then to the extent the mechanism of action with AstraZeneca in Europe is plausibly similar, there have been men there that were also affected. Uh, and, and including that and doubling the denominator would, of course, greatly affect the ratios that we see here. Uh, how should we think about that? I don't disagree with you, um, but, you know, we had, we had observed all cases were in women aged 18 to 48 years old. So, I mean, that is um, be because it, it appeared to be concentrated in that age group. We decided that the best analysis would be to look at that denominator. Um, but certainly, um, uh, I hear what you're saying. And I think for future analyses, we can certainly expand our analysis. Thank you. All right. 
Sorry, we didn't, I was still on mute. Um, we still have hands up from Dr. Sanchez and Dr. Goldman. Um, I will give you an opportunity to speak um, in, in a few minutes. What we're going to do now is pause for the public comment session um, and um, then, then, then we'll return. Um, so um, let's take a, a, a short break, um, a five to seven minutes um, while we get set up and uh, then we'll come back. Um, let's see, I have, I have 13 after the hour, so we'll come back at uh, 20 after the hour and begin our public comment. Thank you.
We will resume in one minute. Dr. Cohen, may we proceed to the uh, public comment session? Yes, that would be great. Thank you very much. So um, at the onset um, of this uh, session, I'd like to uh, welcome and thank the public speakers uh, for addressing the committee today. We take very seriously what you tell us um, and uh, look forward to your presentations. Uh, to all speakers today, um, I uh, want to uh, mention that uh, we have a limited uh, time for a public comment. And in order to make it through all the speakers, um, it is extremely important that each of the speaker limits his or her remarks uh, to the three minutes allotted to them. Um, we will be displaying uh, the time on a, on a timer that will cycle through various colors uh, and then inform you of, of when your time is up. Um, all speakers today have submitted a request in advance of the meeting, and the final uh, list of public commenters was determined via lottery. Uh, again, to the commenters, um, I want to say that um, as you reach the end of your a lot of time, I will thank you with the following phrase. Thank you for your comment. Your time has expired. If you extend 15 seconds past that time, I will uh, say the following. As a courtesy to other speakers, we ask that, you're, that you conclude your comment. And if you extend to 30 seconds past your allotted time, um, I will uh, ask that your microphone be cut and uh, state your comment time has expired. Uh, thank you very much. So. Um, Again, thank you for the uh, public uh, commenters, and we'll begin with our first uh, commenter, uh, Mr. Dell Bigtree. Please uh, come to the microphone. Um, uh, please state your name and any affiliations that you have. Uh, Mr. Bigtree. Dr. Romero, I'm not sure he's on yet. Would you like to skip him and go to the second person? Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, next, uh, We'll go on to uh, Dr. Richard uh, Younghands, and excuse me if I mispronounced your name. Uh, you got Dr. it. Younghands. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Dr. Richard Younghands. I'm an immunotherapist, hematologist, oncologist, uh, uh, trained with Thomas Wallman at the NCI, and uh, I'm associate professor at uh, Boston University School of Medicine and president of IT Bio LLC, an immunotherapy company in Cambridge. Uh, startup, I should say. Um, I have a, com a technical comment about the antiplatelet antibodies. If I have time at the end, I'll allude to, but I want to jump into what I consider the elephant in the room. Um, that is prior uh, infectees. People who have been infected uh, previously, um, I contend, have a superior immunity to any conferred by these um, uh, very good vaccines, even. Uh, and if I'm right, then we're subjecting patients to risk uh, unnecessarily. However small these risks are, which are being addressed today, uh, it also wastes a drug that could have been used to save other people's lives already who waited in line for those who didn't need it. Um, and so the policies I would like to see changed would be to accord infectees the same status as vaccinees officially by CDC, which is an example around the world. This would be for so-called <clears throat> immunity passports, jobs, travel, et cetera, exempt them from vaccination except as uh, vaccination requirements that some jobs have put in place. Um, and any prior positive test by PCR, antigen, or antibody would be accepted. Antibody waning doesn't uh, concern me because uh, neutralizing antibodies are not as judged by this assay as proven in the initial uh, Chinese study uh, that focused on total antibody waning, but it was the wrong focus. New, neutralized antibodies predicted to persist for years. Uh, and antibodies aren't critical anyway. Uh, T cells are the main bulwark of the therapy, I mean, of uh, the immunity. 
this is seen in X-link A, A gamma globulinemia where patients don't get sick from bad viral infections, they get sick from bacterial infections. Proof that infection is better is uh, quickly available. Uh, look at the Pfizer vaccine study, 20,000 patients per arm, 160 in control arm got infected, eight um, uh, in the vaccine arm got infected. If you compare that 20,000 to 20 million patients, who recovered, uh, documented to recover from COVID, that would predict 8,000 second infections. And it's been hard for people to find even a dozen such cases. Uh, CDC estimates a 4.6 to 1 ratio of people in, uh, infected to those who actually tested positive. Uh, and that would mean uh, 138 million people have been infected out of 210 million. Um, Thank you for uh, your comment. Your time has expired. Okay, I'd like to say that I'll be posting this material. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, commenter will be uh, Mr. Del Bigtree. Uh, Mr. Bigtree, please um, state your affiliation and proper pronunciation of your name if I mispronounce it. My name is Del Bigtree. I am the CEO of the Informed Consent Action Network. I'm the host of the Internet Talks of the High Wire. I am formerly a producer of the CBS talk show, The Doctors, where I won an Emmy Award celebrating the best that science and medicine has to offer. I have been attending the meetings at the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices for over three years now, and I've spoken many, many times during public comments, and I have done several now um, of these over the computer. And I have been saying and trying to make the same point for some time now. You at the CDC and at the advisory committee need to start taking much more seriously the visibility of the work that you're doing and the promotion and the PR around it. I have been warning you that you cannot continue to keep promoting products like vaccines made by Johnson & Johnson that have, been not pro have not been properly tested for long-term issues or even short-term issues in the clinical trials. We are talking about a company that has paid out billions of dollars for lying about safety on talcum powder. They always knew it had asbestos. They lied about the Oxycontin epidemic, and yet you at the advisory committee and at the CDC now found your, find yourself in an incredible situation and something that I've been warning you about. Confidence in this vaccine program and now the CDC is in grave, grave danger. We now have a vaccine that is just like the AstraZeneca vaccine in Europe. And I am honestly questioning the CDC, are you going to make the same mistake that the EMA in Europe made and try to cover this up and say, oh, it's going to be just fine, only to have to retract that a couple of weeks later? And now we have nations like Denmark withdrawing the AstraZeneca vaccine because their own science shows that this issue is happening in one in 40,000 people. What will be the plan? The CDC, if it wants to hold on to any credibility right now, is, you know, and not risk not only a loss of confidence in our healthcare system, in the CDC, but maybe in science as we know it. I urge you, please, withdraw Johnson & Johnson completely. Europe is now overrun. The UK, their hospitals are overrun by people that are panicking, even from mild symptoms. Our hospitals can't afford this. This mistake is only to going to get worse and worse. We have two other vaccine options. Please do the CDC a favor. Do this nation a favor and lead by erring on the side of caution for the citizens and not the pharmaceutical industry and pull Johnson & Johnson immediately or we could seriously see the destruction of confidence in all vaccine programs and science as we know it. This is what is now sitting in your hands Thank you. I hope this time you will finally hear my plea. Thank you for your comments. Our next uh, commenter is Ms. Marla Dalton. Um, Ms. Dalton, uh, please, uh, your name uh, and affiliation. Thank you and good afternoon. I am Marla Dalton, Executive Director and CEO of the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases, or NFID. On behalf of NFID, as a long-standing partner of CDC, we appreciate the valuable work of ACIP and the robust U.S. vaccine safety surveillance systems in place. Monitoring the safety of vaccines is an ongoing process, 
and the decision by FDA and CDC to review reports of a rare blood clotting condition among some recipients of COVID-19 vaccines demonstrates the strong U.S. commitment to vaccine safety. To date, there have been six reported cases of blood clotting among the approximately 7 million doses of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine administered in the U.S clearly demonstrating the sensitivity of the vaccine safety system in place. The fact that public health officials have paused administration of the vaccine to investigate these reports is reassuring to all of us who are committed to vaccine safety. And we at NFID stand ready to help communicate the results of the data analysis and any implications for public policy. The actions taken by CDC and FDA also illustrate some of the core principles of communicating about COVID-19, which are outlined in a new NFID report, COVID-19 communications, promoting prevention measures, and vaccine confidence. The report, which was developed with input from more than 50 leading organizations and multidisciplinary experts, is now available on the NFID website at nfid.org. As the science and knowledge around COVID-19 continues to evolve, being open and transparent about what we know and what we do not yet know helps all to manage expectations and reduce anxiety and confusion about vaccines and other COVID-19 prevention measures. The work of ACIP in guiding U.S. immunization policy and overseeing vaccine safety is vital to protecting public health. On behalf of NFID, thank you all for your dedicated service. Thank you for your comments. Uh, that ends our uh, public comment session for this meeting. Um, Dr. Cohen, do we want to proceed uh, or give the the, the group uh, another five minute break? I think um, if you're okay with that, I think we can go ahead and proceed. Um, Very good. We can uh, both continue to ask questions and then also maybe bring up the last slide that Dr. Oliver shared so we can remind uh, the committee what the questions that we're posing to ACIP to discuss are. Thanks. Correct. Let me, let me also return to Dr. Sanchez and Dr. Goldman, uh, who have been waiting uh, patiently to ask their questions. Dr. Sanchez, please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, Jose. Um, it's more of a comment. Um, and, you know, um, I think, first of all, we do have a positive message that we do have two vaccines currently available in the United States that have not been associated with these thrombotic episodes and clotting disorders. So I think we need to have a positive message there um, beyond the fact that the um, VAERS and other reporting guidelines have, have found, have seen the signal. But my other question also is, um, are these cases being investigated further in terms of autopsy? And I guess I could have asked that earlier um, because is there something unique about I mean, not having, with the messenger RNA ones, not seeing this, is it something about the adenovirus vector? And is there anything in these, are autopsies being performed? Is, are these thrombi being examined? Are they finding the adenovirus vector within them? And maybe I'm being a little bit too simplistic. Um, and certainly what, what is the inflammatory, um, you know, signal there? Is it, um, is there something with the, within these clots that um, that are different than other cases? And I just wonder if, if um, I just urge for more investigation, more autopsy specimens, and more um, and looking at these thrombi and seeing if we can see something in there that may have been triggered by the actual, um, it, whether it's the adenovirus vector or something else in the vaccine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Golden, please. Thank you, sir. More of a comment as well. You know, certainly as a practicing internist, I'm really reassured that the VAERS system works. And I really want to reiterate what has been stated before, how important it is for my colleagues on the front lines to be utilizing it. And I really want to thank the CDC and ACIP for the on, uh, as these clinical guidelines really do help us treat the patients on the front line. Now, in regards to the policy question, Certainly, short-term and long-term as a practicing internist for the immediate future, I'm definitely in favor of a pause as we see if more cases come out because the true incidence of this condition may be revealed now that we've had so many more doses administered. 
Um, and certainly, now that my colleagues are aware of this issue, I suspect more will be reported as it is recognized. But I would also suggest we consider the risk versus benefit of the vaccine compared to the risk of getting COVID itself and the potential of death from the disease. And we may lend ourselves more towards an individual decision on which vaccine the individual may want to choose to get, although this could be uh, complicated logistically. And in the long term, I really am hopeful we can see if this is an issue with the vaccine adenovirus platform or is it an issue with this vaccine specifically. Regardless, I really want to stress to the public that they need to remain confident in our process and the science regarding vaccines in general and that we need to continue to vaccinate against COVID and so many other diseases and not to let this uh, sour their decision on getting vaccinated in general, because I really do believe the VAR systems work and we do have confidence in the process and that we'll make the right decision regarding public safety. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Goldman. And I, and I just wanna make one more comment um, uh, regarding the data that was presented by uh, Dr. Oliver. Um, as usual, a, an excellent pre presentation, but um, your, the data on race and ethnicity is, is notably weak if, in my interpretation. Um, I don't know where we are on the exact number today, but um, as of uh, three or four weeks ago, um, only 50% of those individuals receiving uh, the vaccine had uh, provided information regarding race and ethnicity. So um, I, I, I caution you on, on making any um, uh, extrapolations based on the data that we have at this time. Um, and so with that, um, we're gonna proceed uh, to this discussion. Um, and uh, Dr. Oliver, would you please um, uh, start us on this issue and uh, put up the, um, uh, the questions that we are to uh, uh, consider, and then um, we'll open it up for a discussion. Yes, thanks. So the questions that we brought before ACIP today is, does ACIP have enough information to make interim age or risk factor based recommendations for use of the Janssen vaccine? And then what recommendation does ACIP, AP, does ACIP feel is appropriate today, given the currently available information for use of the Janssen vaccine? Thank you very much. So um, as we begin, let me point out to the uh, members of the voting members of the committee that we do not have to arrive at a vote today or a recommendation today um, if we need more information um, if we need more time to think about this we can reconvene later this week or this weekend if necessary um, this should be a considered vote uh, based on the data that you all need having said that um, i'd like to direct some words to the general public that are watching us um, and, and listening to this presentation, these presentations, uh, it's been stated multiple times throughout this, this, uh, this meeting that um, safety has been uh, a, a premier, uh, paramount uh, issue in, in our deliberations uh, for this vaccine, for recommendations, and for following the vaccine. As we started our deliberations in April of last year, that was foremost uh, uh, on the list of things that we needed to keep in mind, and we are doing that at this time. Um, th that uh, the FDA has stated the same and pharmaceutical companies have stated uh, also that safety is, uh, is the ultimate uh, goal here in the vaccine. Um, it, our system for our systems for identifying these uh, rare adverse events work as pointed out by Dr. Shimabukuro and others, um, the fact that we have found uh, identified uh, these uh, very rare clotting uh, the uh, incidents um, points to the robust safety systems that are in place and make our uh, vaccine um, safety systems uh, some of the strongest in the world. And I think it's important for the public to understand that, that uh, as we go forward with new vaccines, we continue to have ongoing um, safety checks. Um, at, with regard to the issue of uh, vaccines and in general in the, in, in the public, um, I think we are. We all know that we're, we are encountering vaccine hesitancy or reluctance regarding um, the use of these vaccines for the prevention of disease. Uh, Dr. Goldman uh, spoke to this, I think, uh, just just now, and and um, we need to um, have a decision and come to a, a decision regarding recommendations 
um, in a timely manner and ask if we do pause, that the pause be sufficient to address the question. Um, this is an issue of safety and risk benefit um, analysis. Um, we may not answer all the questions uh, at this time, but we need to come to uh, a, a decision on this in, um, in an appropriate time frame and not delay it. Um, this reminds me of, of, of the, the talk that Dr. Frieden gave us uh, when we were discussing a pneumococcal vaccine. And um, we have the data before us. We need to act on that data as appropriate and add to that data as we go forward uh, to modify or to strengthen it. So I'll turn it over to discussion at this time. Um, let's begin. Uh, I believe Dr. Fry has her hand up first. Please. Thank you. Uh, this is Sharon. I'm just uh, curious um, what the working group had discussed regarding just thrombocyte, uh, I'm sorry, uh, clotting in general and um, DVTs or PEs or what have you in general and whether that was taken into consideration. I know that we're talking about CVST here with thrombocytopenia, and that's very unique, but <clears throat> is there an increased incidence that also in uh, clotting without thrombocytopenia? And did the working group talk about this all, at all, or there clearly is not an increase, or how, how is that factoring in the overall picture? Maybe, Beth, you, you might. Sorry, Sharon, can you, are you talking about other uh, clotting events with yes. thrombocytopenia? Without. Or are you without, talking just, about clotting events in general with or without thrombocytopenia? The latter, with and without thrombocytopenia. Was, was there an increased incidence of that in general also? We did not focus on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Long. I would just uh, echo what Sharon said. You know, the thrombocyte opinion, which is so telling here, it may be, uh, you know, only very severe, and it may be only severe that really gets your cerebral um, uh, sinuses. So I, the others are much harder to figure out because the underlying occurrence is so much higher. Um, but I would think we are ready to make an interim decision to continue a pause for at least a month until we see what else uh, comes out about does it occur in men. We now, in the most recent weeks, are immunizing younger and younger individuals. Uh, and we might be able to make some uh, risk-related, uh, uh, more definitive potential use of the vaccine again in a month. But I suspect, because of what we know now, that uh, this occurrence of these events has been in half the number that uh, we have as the number immunized, uh, considering when they could have occurred and could have been reported and that we are going to get many more things occur in the next month that will help us with a more definitive. So I would be, I would be very much in favor of a continued pause, and I think I would be opposed to continued use at this time. Thank you, Dr. Long. Dr. Bernstein. Uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to make sure that I understood Dr. Fink's um, statements representing the FDA. Did I understand a risk management approach and which included warning statements? And I was wondering what was meant by uh, warning statements and how that actually would be operationalized in the real world. Thank you for that question. The, the warning statements that uh, I mentioned would be uh, warnings in the EUA fact sheets uh, for healthcare providers and recipients that are um, uh, given to, to vaccine recipients um, at the time uh, or, or before, actually, the, the vaccine is administered. And the risk management uh, approach would be uh, warning statements in combination with other uh, communication from FDA, CDC, and, and other sources. 
Thank you. Yeah, the EUA fact sheet is a is multiple pages as it is. And many of the people receiving vaccines are not having an opportunity to to talk with their own provider about it. So there might be a disconnect in in some way. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. Uh, Ms. Bata. Sorry, trying to find my unmute. Um, as I've been hearing this data and understanding how rare this event is, um, and, and what I've heard in conversations um, over the last 24 hours, um, there's there's um, two sides of this. There's the you're overreacting, and then the other side is um, you should just stop this. And um, I know that uh, there's been consideration of a uh, provider risk-based discussion about continuing to use the Janssen um, vaccine for those who would feel comfortable. Um, but I I think that I'm I'm coming on the side um, similar to what uh, Dr. Long and Dr. Fry have said that it, it would be helpful to have some additional information. Um, and, and by having a little more robust information, I, I think we can be much more confident in how we talk about um, the safety of this vaccine. Um, because right now, uh, the, the confidence for COVID vaccines is, is just right at a precipice. We've got people that can't wait to get it and others who have been waiting and seeing. And this this will, um, I think, uh, contributes to that confidence that people have. And so I would be in favor of getting more information. Thank you, Dr. Alt. Well, my question or comment is kind of a corollary to that. How did the working group uh, discuss how much longer they would need to get this information? I mean, we do have a meeting scheduled May 5th, which is three weeks from now, not a month uh, from now. And I was curious to know, you know, what the logistics were there. Um, this is Dr. Bell. I would say that there sort of wasn't um, final a final conclusion about um, how long would be necessary. I think there was a general sense that um, there needs to be enough time to provide the kind of data that the working group felt was necessary but also that it was extremely important to do this as expeditiously as possible because of all of the potential, all of the, the potential unintended consequences of a prolonged pause. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Talman. Yes, so I, I probably will reiterate some of what other people have said, and pardon me for doing that, but I want to say up front, we are very fortunate because we have multiple other alternatives in the U.S. to help stop this pandemic. And we have very good, well-proven alternatives that we are not seeing safety signals in. So I think that puts us in a little bit of a different position, and we can be much more cautious and thoughtful and use the old motto of first do no harm. And so I think truly in a setting where we don't have enough data for other um, embolic, I mean, thrombotic events such as stroke and DVT and PE, um, we should have the time to do that. I also think we're in a setting where the usual treatment may be rather harmful. And so we can't say, oh, this is treatable, let it go. Um, thirdly, I think we, don't know enough about age yet. My suspicion is that events like strokes may be underreported or not flagged, and these occur more often in older adults. So I'm very hesitant to say it does not occur in anyone over 50. Um, so I, I really, I feel like we're fortunate and have the opportunity to wait a period of time and continue to hold until we have this information and strongly encourage people to continue using our messenger RNA vaccines that have proven to be safe and effective um, until we know more. And if we can say the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is incredibly safe and we're not worried about this, we will come back and say that. If not, 
been we've done no harm and we've been able to continue vaccinating in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Talbot. Uh, Dr. Sanchez. Thank you. Um, I agree with uh, Dr. Long and the others. Um, I think that a pause, a continued pause, is um, is is what I would favor and recommend. Um, I I at this at the current time, I am not continuing um, vaccination of um, any individual with this product. Sanchez, thank you. Dr. Bell. Thank you very much, Dr. Romero. I thought I would um, just give my own view on this topic um, so that, um, you know, I have an opportunity to comment. Um, basically, you know, to be very frank, I do not want to vote on this issue today. Um, I do not want to vote not to recommend the vaccine. I think that is not really something I necessarily believe, but I, um, do not feel that we have, it's not surprising. We've, you know, been kind of looking at this issue for two days or less. I just don't, don't feel that we have enough information to make an evidence-based decision. We won't have all the information, but I think there are some things that we can um, gather relatively quickly, which all have to do with the benefit risk balance. We do need to better understand the risk, which we know is going to be very rare uh, very low, but we really don't know exactly how uh, low and how to correctly characterize it, what the denominator should be, what is the numerator, how many cases are there with thrombocytopenia that is not CVST as an example. So there's a number of things like that. Second, we need to understand that risk, whatever it is, in some kind of context. Um, with other uh, other things that might cause thrombosis, for example, because I think that uh, you know, it's important for the public to understand when we say rare, what does that mean with respect to other risks that we might take every day? And then thirdly, I think we need to, you know, have a some sort of formal risk benefit analysis that allows us to very clearly point out to the American people why we think it is the risk benefit favors whatever the recommendation is that we end up with. I mean, I, I want to be able to, you know, feel comfortable with my family members, myself for that matter, um, to receive this vaccine. Um, nothing is risk-free, and as people have said, you know, we are ahead of ourselves here because we so quickly identified this and because of what's been going on in Europe. So the bottom line of this long exposition is I do not think we should vote today. I think that the implications of a vote do not to recommend are stronger than I at least want to that I do not want to send that message so I think we need to not vote and um, gather the necessary information so that we can make an evidence-based decision um, thank you dr. Bell doc, dr. Um, sorry was that was that dr. Cohen yes I just wanted to um, uh, add and clarify that we do have a scheduled meeting on May 5th but if we need to have if 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 if, if the ACP if we can pull together information and we can come back before that tier period, we don't have to wait until May 5th to have a follow-up uh, discussion. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. So, uh, sorry, Dr. McDowell, let me just say this and, and, and then I'll, uh, sorry, Ms. McDowell, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, so um, th that was, uh, you know, certainly one option that we could consider is that um, to, to continue this pause um, until our next meeting or um, we could meet sooner if there is more information that allows us to make a final a vote, a more concrete vote, prior to that time. I think, as Dr. Alt pointed out, uh, and, and now Dr. Cohen, that we have another meeting in three weeks, um, and, and that would fall in this period of, of uh, a pause and, and allow us to get more information and see what more cases come forward. Um, so, uh, uh, Dr. M uh, sorry, uh, Ms. McNally, please. Thank you. And I think I may have a clarification question of Dr. Shimabukuro. So it seems to me that it's very reasonable to try and gather more data. And if I understand it correctly, from the cases that Janssen talked about that were reported directly to Janssen, ultimately those cases were reported to theirs. And I'm just wondering if Dr. Shimabukuro can comment on what might be a reasonable period of time for us to gather more data and reevaluate. 
Thank you. Well, I, 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 if you look at the, um, I have to pull up my own presentation here. I think the median um, onset was eight days, six to 13 um, days. So you've got, I mean, you've got individuals who, if, who, who have been vaccinated, who I think we want to follow out um, for what we think is maybe a reasonable risk window um, and, and, and time to actually capture any, any um, cases that, that might be identified in that capture and evaluate any cases that might be identified in that in that risk window, which looks like about one to two weeks. Um, plus, I mean, there there may be there may be cases out there um, which which uh, which have not come to our attention, but might come to our attention now that now that this information is out there. We call that, that that's a reporting bias called stimulated reporting. So I, I do think in the in the coming weeks we are going to gather more information. We're going to continue to gather more information, um, and 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 it, we will continue to to get better, more specific information as we can access the medical records. Um, where we'll we'll have um, we'll get a better picture of what's going on. Um, we are going to to refine our uh, our observed versus expected analysis. I know that the folks at the FDA are working on that. So I think in the coming weeks, we will have more information and better information where we can assess the signal and possibly um, uh, characterize the risk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Fry. Thank you. I was just wondering a question for Dr. Shima Bukharo. Um, why is the delay in, in uh, entering data into VAERS? So if someone has an adverse event, such as a CVST, how long does it take for the physician to actually report that data after the event? Thank you. On average. Well, I, I mean, it, it, the, the decision to report, um, the decision to report really happens at the healthcare provider level. Um, we encourage but there, there are reporting requirements under EUA, and um, this would constitute um, a serious, uh, serious, serious adverse event because these individuals, you know, at least for the six that we've observed, are all hospitalized. Um, so this would fall under the emergency use authorization reporting requirements. Um, CEC's recommendation is to report an adverse event as, as, as soon as possible um, after the, the onset of symptoms or after um, a person or a healthcare provider becomes aware uh, of the symptoms. So we, we want to get these reported to bear as quickly as possible. And that's one part of it. The other part is how quickly do we um, process, follow up, and analyze these reports. And I mean, be, because we were following these reports, these types of reports closely because of what was happening in Europe, um, we are, we are basically, um, reviewing these, um, in, in collaboration with FDA is, is, is in, in, in fairly close to real time. They come in, um, the categorization of serious or non-serious is, is made known to us quickly. Um, we can review these serious reports. We can identify potential CVST or other thrombotic events, um, and uh, we can expedite records collection um, where either we direct the contractor to expedite collection on a specific report or we just simply do it ourselves. Um, so we have ways of compressing that timeline and um, our focus now is to, is to make sure that we identify and follow up and assess and analyze these reports as quickly as possible. So I think on, on our end, it's a fairly quick process and, and based on the reports that that we've seen that have come in, providers are reporting those on a, in, in a timely manner as well. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lee. Thank you. I, sorry, you're gonna have to bear with me. <laughs> I, I, I've been uh, thinking about this for 48 hours and so I wanted to just make a few statements and uh, put out a few requests. Um, so, uh, you know, 
everyone acknowledges that risk is an inherent part of life. We would not be vaccinating anyone if there weren't a COVID-19 pandemic ongoing right now. Um, but there is a population level benefit risk balance that we need to consider and individual benefit risk balance. Um, I, I think the role of ACIP in this instance is to focus on mitigating that risk. Um, we also need to better understand the benefits because I've also seen patients, and I know many of you have, admitted with clotting disorders and thrombocytopenia, uh, sometimes immune-mediated thrombocytopenia associated with, with COVID-19 disease. Um, so we really need to have a balanced picture of um, both the benefits and the risks. Uh, from the ACIP perspective, I think there are three things we can do to mitigate risk. One is to identify populations at the highest risk for this comp potential complication um, and adapt our recommendations to minimize exposure to those at highest risk for this potential adverse event. The second is to educate patients about the benefits and risks of different vaccines um, and to ensure that patients seek care in a timely manner. And the third is um, ensuring that our healthcare systems are um, able to diagnose and manage these cases in an incredibly timely way. Uh, because if we can manage these cases early and well, you know, similar to anaphylaxis, we may be able to employ strategies that change the outcomes that we see with these patients. Um, so that said, I also just have to comment that, you know, um, this is so challenging because the impact of ACIP decisions on the global stage is clear to me, given our past experience with rotavirus vaccines. And I think that the benefit risk balance may be very different in other countries where vaccines are either not available or not feasible for um, widespread implementation. Um, and I recognize that our responsibility at ACIP is to individuals in the US, but I also feel the weight of the burden of a global responsibility that we also have and the impact that our decision making could potentially worsen inequities. So, um, regardless of whatever decision we make on this particular uh, safety signal, I think it's important for us to make sure that we're collaborating with partners outside the U.S. to address those inequities in whatever ways we can. So then thinking about what we need to do ahead, I, um, you know, what information is needed before I think a vote can be taken. I agree with Dr. Bell. I don't think we have enough information today. I think we need to um, go through the signal refinement phase where we can capture age and gender stratified rates of CVST and the outcomes associated with CVST among both vaccinees and those with COVID-19 disease, um, that, there, that we have a better understanding of risk factors associated with CVST and um, those who have poor outcomes associated with CVST. We need to review the data across multiple vaccine safety surveillance systems, and I wholeheartedly agree that we need a formal benefit risk assessment uh, to make a well-informed decision. Uh, we also you know, need to move through the signal refinement phase, I think, as quickly as possible in order to be able to support evidence-based decision-making. So, I, you know, and I know everyone knows this around the table, but we really need strong collaboration across the federal agencies and with global partners in, in order to be able to make the best possible decision in as timely a manner as possible, because I, I continue to feel that we're in a race against time and the variants. Um, but we need to do so in the safest possible way. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Cotton. Thank you, uh, Grace. I very much agree with what you said. I would just like to add that the um, putting this vaccine on pause for those of us that are frontline healthcare workers has really been devastating. Um, I agree um, in general that we don't have enough time, but we don't have enough data to make a decision at this time. But we were planning on using this vaccine um, in the state of Massachusetts for people who are homebound and otherwise not able to get a vaccine. We were planning on using it for our vulnerable inpatient population, often with many comorbidities and at high risk for disease, but who haven't been able to get um, vaccinated otherwise. And then it certainly was going to be used in um, what may be otherwise underserved uh, populations or populations that aren't able to get MR mRNA vaccines. So um, I definitely want us to be cautious and very careful with our decision making, but I also just want to emphasize that this um, one and done vaccine that didn't require the cold chain that the mRNA vaccines do is, um, you know, it's, it's a significant uh, loss. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that for sort of the underserved populations that did need access to this vaccine. Thank you. 
Very good. Um, any other comments from the uh, from the voting members? Um, Dr. Cohen, we have a, a hand up from one of the liaisons. Um, are they uh, allowed to comment at this point? Yes, that would be great. We can move to um, some good. broader comment. Be before we do, I just want to um, summarize a couple of the things that I've heard and give some potential options uh, moving forward. Um, so I, it sounds like uh, uh, we have certainly heard that there's a need for more of a refinement of the risk as well as risk benefit analyses. And I just want to remind everyone that um, the goal today was to be um, as transparent and communicate information as rapidly as we had it available with uh, the ACIP members, with our liaison organizations, and with uh, the public, uh, knowing that some of this work um, we will be uh, uh, doing around the clock over uh, the next uh, several days. So um, we are working on those analyses. I think one of the questions for ACIP today is, with what we've been presented and, and not having that additional information, is ACIP comfortable um, per preferring to uh, continue um, the current pause or not make any decision um, about uh, this at this time? Or is there um, any or, or do people prefer to um, refine um, or to make a recommendation around um, shifting the pause for a short basis, potentially, for example, pausing just in a certain population versus the entire population that is currently paused uh, at this time. So when the word interim is made, that interim um, shift can be for just a week or two as we try to refine. I know typically when we make interim recommendations, we're thinking for longer periods of time. Um, but there are lots of different options here, including just um, continue, just waiting for more information. Um, but I do think that um, there's a, a critical question about um, if the pause should continue for the whole population, as um, some have indicated, versus um, should that potentially be refined. Thank you. Um, let me turn to other comments now. Dr. Shaw. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Uh, good afternoon again, everyone. This is Neeraj Shaw. I'm uh, speaking in my capacity as president of the Association of State Territorial Health Officers. I'm also the director of the State of Maine Center for Disease Control. And I must express concern about the direction that I fear the committee may be going. We are in a situation where not making a decision is tantamount to making a decision. Any extension of the pause will invariably result in the fact that the most vulnerable individuals in the United States were prime candidates for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will remain vulnerable. The most at risk will remain at risk and those who would benefit immediately from vaccination will remain unvaccinated for an unknown period of time. That would come at a period where the United States is still logging 5,000 deaths in the past seven days just across the country, and at a time when there were 489,000 new cases just in the past seven days. The initial reason for the pause was, among others, to ensure that healthcare providers and recipients were apprised of the possible risks, as well as to be on the lookout for them so appropriate treatment could be given. It's always possible to get more data, and indeed, in the history of pharmaceuticals, we are always refining our understanding of risk. That's always part of it, but there are also tools available today to better evaluate and mitigate that risk while continuing the provision of the J&J &J vaccine. I would urge that any pause be counterbalanced by consideration of the equity considerations that would befall from any lengthening of the pause. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Freihofer. Uh, Sandra Freihofer, a liaison for the American Medical Association, speaking as an individual, as a practicing physician. I, I must tell you that this whole process today has really increased my confidence in vaccine safety. 
I greatly appreciate the honesty and transparency and the quick action that the FDA and the CDC have taken. Um, I uh, have listened um, to the comments from our, our esteemed group of um, ACIP members, and um, I hope that when the membership uh, does vote that they will, uh, that I personally hope that they will support a some pause so we can figure out if this um, is a needle in the haystack or the tip of an iceberg. Um, there are other, M other vaccines available. There is a supply of these vaccines. And I am so sensitive to the equity of vaccine distribution. I know that there are many patients that have not been able to get vaccinated that need to get vaccinated, but we wanna make sure these vaccines are safe. And I do think a, a, a short pause to give us a chance to collect this information, to give physicians and, and patients um, time to, um, you know, to, to understand um, what we've been talking about, and there might be more cases coming out. But I, uh, at the end of the day, I just really respect the process, and I'm proud to be a part of it. Thank you very much, Dr. Freihofer. Um, Dr. Talbot. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, briefly that I do appreciate the comments about getting to those who are homebound and are difficult to find. Um, I do, however, um, want to say that I am also worried that those that cannot get to the medical care and those who are difficult to find may, um, may be at risk for severe clot if they do develop clot and may not get to care in enough time. So it, it is a double-edged sword and it is concerning. Um, and I think that's why many of us would like the risk benefit analysis so that we can help figure that out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Duchin. Thank you, Jeff Duchin, Infectious Diseases Society of America. Um, I would just like to reemphasize uh, for the public that well, what we're talking about is a very rare, albeit serious, event that's associated with uh, a vaccine that was detected through our vaccine safety system. And uh, that if the ACIP elects to pause further, um, it should not be interpreted as a signal that there is an increased concern uh, about vaccine safety today beyond which was evident initially, but a desire to better characterize the risk in order to make the best possible guidance going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other comments from uh, the liaisons um, or the working group members? I'm not seeing any new hands. I'm not seeing any. Oh, uh, Dr. Long, please. We didn't really uh, answer the question for Dr. Cohn about could we parcel out any less at risk, more at risk groups in uh, rather than just an universal pause. And I think we would be uncomfortable with that because, you know, the lack of specific and large data that would help us um, decide this person is less at risk, more at risk. Certainly everybody is at risk. And although it's a very small risk, it is so serious. I mean, this would likely, this could be limb life. It could be a severe uh, consequences for your life, neurologic consequences. So I, I think that there would be, uh, although I understand the unintended consequences, um, I think we can live with the unintended consequences because the amount of vaccine that we do have, and it would be a, the wrong message and a real mistake to, to uh, the people uh, who would be getting this. Uh, we're not able to inform them accurately at this moment about the benefit, the risk. So I think that we we can't parcel out groups that are more or less at risk because we don't have enough information. And I would speak again in favor of a pause until we have a better data. Thank you for those comments. Um, let's see, is uh, Dr. Lee? Yeah, you know, I just, you know, reflecting on Dr. Long's comments, I just, you know, I do think that, um, 
know, obviously all of us care uh, very much about safety and individual and population benefit risk balance. I, I, I'm, I'm struggling with the idea that uh, I, I don't think an indefinite pause is a good thing. I just think we're going to have to have whatever data we have and make a decision. I think the main question I have is whether or not we think we can um, assess where we are in another week or two. Even in the last 48 hours, a tremendous amount of data has come out um, and work with our colleagues to come up with a, a, a sort of a time frame for this. But I think an indefinite pause is, as Dr. Shaw mentioned, functionally a decision. And I, I would not advocate that because that is not the decision I think that makes the most sense. Dr. Lee. Um, Dr. Bell. I, I was just gonna. Um, I was just gonna respond uh, to Dr. Lee. I completely agree that we definitely don't want it to feel like an indefinite pause. And I think, just if if ACIP from a process perspective is if there is no um, motion or or desire to vote um, on a recommendation today, the res that would result in us going back to work um, as quickly as possible and coming back uh, with an additional emergency meeting in. Um, a week, 10 days, um, two weeks at the most, um, but we will try to get the work done that we need to get done to present to you as quickly as possible. Um, and we would um, you know, try to provide enough information for a decision at that time. Thank you very much, Dr. Cohen, for, for providing that time frame. I, you anticipated my question. Um, Dr. Bell. Yeah, actually, just a, actually anticipated my question as well. I, I do, do not want to be sending a message that we are more concerned um, that there's the, in, in a message that there's some huge concern here of a different order of magnitude than any other vaccine safety signals that we evaluate because that's not the message that I want to send and I don't want to send a message that there's something fundamentally wrong with this vaccine because that also I don't agree with so whatever the process is that allows us to as expeditiously and quickly as possible have enough information, which is never all the information, but it is hopefully a few of the kinds of things that a number of people have mentioned that are important and are necessary um, as quickly as possible. However, we do that, however, we can do that. And Dr. Cohen sounds like you've just explained it. Um, that's um, what I would like to do because as I say, um, it's a very rare event. Nothing in life is risk-free, uh, but I want to be able to understand and defend the decision that I've made based on um, a reasonable amount of data. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't want to cut the dis discussion short, but I just want to make sure. Uh, Dr. Cohen, is, is there a time frame in which you must end this uh, meeting because you have to uh, leave that uh, that building where you're in, or can we continue uh, as questions keep uh, coming up or comments? We, up? we are fine continuing the questions. I think that um, if we could end, uh, if we could shoot for 5:30, that would be great. But um, it, if, but I, I don't want to cut the conversation short. Perfect. Thank you. Neither did I. Um, uh, so let me see here. Um, Dr. Alt, is your hand up? Yes, I, I just wanted to go back to Dr. Bell because really the point of my question that I asked earlier was I don't want an indefinite pause either. That's why I was curious about what kind of time frame we were talking about. So I'm reassured hearing that this could be a relatively short amount of time. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bernstein. Yes, um, I agree. I would not want this to be an indefinite uh, pause. Um, maybe Dr. Oliver has uh, can answer this. I was interested to know how many J and J vaccinees can we expect data from in what time frame looking uh, forward over the next week, two, three. Can uh, anyone hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Dr. Oliver, did you have an answer for that? Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? 
Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. I think I had a mic issue earlier. Um, so the 3.8 million um, doses were administered in the last two weeks. I don't have a you know further breakdown on uh, each each week. Um, as Dr. Shimabukuro mentions, you know we expect um, some stimulated reporting now that all of this is out, um, and and that we're highlighting and kind of um, asking for reported cases. So. We would expect that um, the delay between uh, presentation and diagnosis and then diagnosis to reporting to VAERS would actually be, um, you know, a much faster kind of turnaround now that the Han um, and and other, um, you know, educational methods are out. So I, we'll have to, to see, but I think we anticipate, um, you know, that we could get um, additional information on cases if they're out there. We will find out about them hopefully relatively quickly. Thank you. Um, so uh, I see uh, Dr. Dushan's hand is up. Uh, did you want to ask another or make another comment, Dr. Uh, Dushan? Sorry, taking it down. No, no, just making sure. Uh, Thank you. And uh, Dr. Alt, yours is still up, so I just want to make sure. Dr. Shaw? I must express concern again over the, 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 the this line of concern. Our discussion. My concern is as follows. Uh, I understand the rationale behind the pause, but we should also have a theory of lifting the pause. And if uh, the concept of operations right now is to simply accrue more data without a theory of what those data may mean and how we might evaluate them, it is just as possible that the committee may in three weeks say, well, let's just hold on for even more data. So if we are going to have an extension of the pause, we should at least couple it with the theory of what lifting the pause may look like and under what criteria we would do so. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Dr. Lee. Thank you. I'm hoping I can respond to this, at least with my own opinion. Um, so, you know, I, to me, it's a, a not, a, not um, data in terms of having perfect data, because we'll never have perfect data and there will always be uncertainty. But it's really, for me, about getting um, better risk estimates and understanding action or recommendations, uh, if we can, to minimize exposure to those who may be at highest risk for this particular adverse event. Um, it's possible we may not have any more information, in which case I still think we're going to have to make a decision or a recommendation at that time. Uh, but I, I think that um, my hope is that in the next week or two, we can actually capture that uh, in a more uh, robust way. Uh, because I feel like the benefit risk balance to me is unclear without having the risk estimate of this particular potential adverse event uh, by age, by gender, and um, understanding other risk factors that may contribute. So that's my hope, but I agree we need to make a recommendation uh, soon. Thank you. Um, are there any other comments? I see no hands at this time. So. Do I, am I summarizing it correctly that we are not ready to vote at this time? Dr. Romero, what I'm hearing um, from the ACIP members and liaisons is that um, there is um, a strong desire to, um, to reconvene as quickly as possible um, uh, after uh, both uh, uh, some risk benefit uh, as well as uh, additional risk refinement um, has been done, which we will do, um, which we will um, commit to at CDC is doing as uh, rapidly as possible. Um, and uh, at this time, ACIP would not provide any, um, uh, d does not uh, wish to vote or put any motions on the table to vote for a change in the current recommendation. So. While the recommendation is paused, we, we would still have our, our, our current recommendation um, uh, and we would continue to pause on that uh, until, um, or we would, CDC would likely choose to pause on that. I can't confirm, but, but this would be providing no recommendation to our director um, until we meet again in a week or 10 days. Excellent. Very, very good. And our, our does anyone on the committee have a opposition to that? 
Okay, I guess uh, seeing no hands. Uh, very good. That, as you as you said, uh, Dr. Cohen, we will go forward. Great. Then I think um, the meeting um, can be dismissed, and we will. Um, uh, find a time to reconvene. Um, we anticipate today is Wednesday. We'll try to identify what that date is by Friday of this week so that people have a little bit more time to get it on the calendars. And we will, um, uh, uh, and we, you know, appreciate all of your time and all of your guidance and expertise that you've provided us, us today, even though um, uh, we did not make an official recommendation. Um, your input today was incredibly helpful in terms of helping uh, uh, inform our work over the next week. Thank you. So uh, with that, uh, meeting adjourned, and uh, uh, we will wait to hear when we will reconvene. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye.